Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the May 21st, 2019 Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, Supervisor McPherson's just finishing up an interview downstairs. He'll be up momentarily, but we're gonna call the meeting to order and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Good morning. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Here. Bren? Here. Caput. Here. McPherson? And Chair Coonerty. Here. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask you to join me now in a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have any late additions or additions or deletions to our agenda? Yes, and on the regular agenda, item nine, there's additional materials, a revised memo, packet page 49, and on the consent agenda, item 20, there's additional materials, a revised ordinance, packet pages 255 and 256, and on item 39, there's a correction, attachment A is deleted, packet pages 528 and 530. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Now I'm gonna ask if there are any board members who would like to pull any items from our consent agenda. Uh, pull no, but comment on later. In a minute, yes, thank you. Uh, so seeing none, now we're gonna open it up uh, for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are on today's agenda, either the regular agenda, the closed session agenda, or the consent agenda, as well as items that are not on our agenda, but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and so can I see how many people would like to speak today? Please, if you can, line up, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name's Olivia Martinez. I'm staff representative for SEIU members. Um, and I'm here in support of item 11. I know I'm supposed to talk about it later, but I have negotiations at 10. It's fine, you can um, absolutely talk about it now. Okay, thank you. Um, we are in support in terms of the plan that CAO is proposing. Um, parking is a huge issue at all the different campuses at Emmeline Freedom um, here. And I think that he has a legacy in terms of creating parking. I know that he created a huge structure in Watsonville, which many people thought it wasn't useful, but now it's a huge parking space for a lot of, of our nonprofits as well that use. So we are in total support of item 11. Thank you. Thank you. Does this thing reset? Okay, good morning. I want to talk a little bit about the application to oppose the road show and the positive things that have come out of this. Uh, one is I made a lot of good friends. One of them in particular is trying to change my ways from a glass half empty to a glass half full. So in that spirit, I'd like to thank these following heroes for stepping forward in opposition of this application. First of all, the 5,000 members of the community the county supervisors, Mr. McPherson and Mr. Coonerty, Sheriff Hart, Chiefs of Police Mills, Honda and Terry McManus, Mayors Dillis, Estrada and Watkins, from the media, Philip Gomez, Felix Cortez, Rosie Chalmers and Ashley Scantriano, local groups, Save Our Shores, San Lorenzo Valley Watchdogs, and our very own Santa Mierda. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Only two minutes? Yes, two minutes. Um, I'm Tony Crane from Aptos, representing a group of uh, individuals there against uh, the Second Story Program. I'm going to read from the project description of the grant. The County of Santa Cruz will purchase and renovate real property to expand its pure respite program from six to eight beds, period. Later it says, Second Story provides short-term residential support in a home-like environment for six individuals at a time and will increase to eight individuals with the new facility, period, end of story. Here's an email from Wanda Williams. Uh, this is in a letter I have going out to the county. 
In an email by Ms. Wanda Williams from Santa Cruz Zoning Department dated October 2nd, 2017, which was sent in response to a complaint filed by citizens regarding the illegal operation of a commercial care facility in a residential neighborhood, Ms. Williams stated, I have taken additional steps to warn the facility operator against operating an eight bed facility and based on her response that there was never any discussion about operating an eight bed facility at this location coupled with the building inspection to substantiate this, I am satisfied that the operator has no intent to do so. Um, on October 3rd, Ms. Williams sent a second email in which she wanted to clarify based on information given to her by county council that Welfare and Institutions Code 5116 allows six bed facilities serving six or fewer persons with disabilities in a residential neighborhood and that the current grant authorizes expansion to eight beds. Uh, later, um, it says that uh, because of the answer that she got, it does not require a level five permit approval or a public hearing. All of that were, were lies. So that goes to a criminal, actually, aspect of this, where they knew that this was an eight bed facility and they told a public official that it was not, and therefore no legal proceedings occurred. Thank that, you. that is not okay. Thank you, Mr. Crane. Good morning. Good morning, board, chair, uh, CAO, members of the public. My name is Steve Wiesner from the, the Public Works Department here, your Public Works Department. We've got a few members from our department with us, and uh, we'd like to thank your board for your proclamation last week, uh, declaring this week uh, Public Works Week in Santa Cruz County. Um, as you're aware, Public Works staff work diligently each and every day, uh, 365 days a year, to keep our communities healthy and safe. Um, locally, our Public Works Department, we're responsible to design, build, operate, and maintain roads roads and bridges, and storm drains and flood control facilities, sanitary sewers and wastewater treatment plants, and for solid waste so disposal and recycling. It's a lot of work we do. And of course, in addition, our um, department provides administrative services to the county for surveying, for property management, um, and for capital project delivery, such as libraries and public safety facilities. Um, so please join me in thanking our dedicated staff and professionals who not only provide these day-to-day -day services to our communities, but uh, we're also first responders in emergencies. Um, and I know we're all aware of the type of emergencies that our county can, can face. Um, we faced many over the, the last decades. Um, and so this week, uh, we celebrate not only our staff um, in our county, but we celebrate public works staffs all across our region, our state, and of course our country. Um, so we greatly appreciate your board's support, the support of the CAO, um, for the critical responsibilities that we have um, and the endeavors that we undertake uh, every day. Um, and uh, we uh, will continue our mission of protecting our communities, providing safe and reliable and quality services. So thank you very much, we appreciate it. Thank you. And we're just, we're grateful to all of you uh, who work hard day and night, and especially when these critical incidents happen, you're out there uh, make, keeping our community safe. So thank you for the work you do. You bet. Uh, thank you also for me. Good morning, board. Uh, <clears throat> I'm here to mention about the ordinance number nine for banning the flavored tobaccos, and uh, I'm one of the owners in Santa Cruz for two shops. Uh, I, I believe banning the tobacco will not help uh, the youth on uh, non-smoking the product because the online is full, full of these products as well, and that's where they mostly get their product from. Our stores have been in the business in Santa Cruz County and the city for over nine years, and we are always followed the rules of the age regulations. And uh, our sales are almost 40% is on these products. And it will be a major loss for the city in sales tax revenue as well. So please consider not banning the product. Thank you. Thank you. All those tall people. Uh, hello, I'm Sheila Delaney. From, I live in the third district. I'm representing the fifth district as the president of the Valley Women's Club. Um, we've come before you before about um, recycling and the need to close down, excuse me, our redemption recycling centers. So I would like to encourage you most sincerely to vote in favor of item 61 on the consent agenda. We've been in discussions with the state, with Gray Bears, and with our own organization to ensure that there is a seamless transition. It's painful for us to close down, but it's good to know that these things will go forward in a positive 
positive way. I'd especially like to thank Supervisor Leopold and Supervisor McPherson for <coughs> requiring that displaced workers be considered in any actions going forward. That has been done, and we're very pleased to say that things will be seamless as far as we can do it. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. Melissa Freebaron. This is the last time I will speak on the Harm Reduction Roadshow application. Something I want to draw your attention to is the Office of AIDS report on why they would certify a state-sponsored uh, syringe program. The key principles for the framework for injection drug use health and wellness, drug users should have access to drug and alcohol treatment on demand. Services should should be provided in a manner that encourages engagement and retention in care. All drug users should receive the same level of care as any other individual accessing health care or social services. This comes directly from the Office of AIDS. So this is where my confusion kind of sets in. These state-sponsored um, applications were meant for communities that don't have a city and county ordinance already in place. And they were meant to stop the spread of HIV and Hep C outbreaks. Locally, we have a syringe program. Program. We need the county and all of your leadership to fix the current county program. The stats are out for April. There were over 68,000 needles passed out. We have enough needles in this county. What we need now is the money behind drug and alcohol addiction treatment services. Janice, right now, workers are fighting for a living wage to retain workers, and they're fighting for that for a reason. They're the best people to provide the care. A lot of those people are recovered addicts themselves. You know, these pro pro programs are supposed to be for addicts, so I hope that you listen to the people in recovery who are speaking recently out of about this against it because their voices are the ones that should carry the most weight thanks thank you hi good morning my name is Letitia and I'm a resident in the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County I've lived up in the Loma Prieta school district up on Summit Road since 1992 where my husband and I raised our three children I followed John Leopold and attended a lot of the community meetings and have appreciated the attention and presence in our community. I really hope that my voice is heard today. I know that I speak for many. As a community member, I fully support the ordinance to eliminate the sale of flavored tobacco products in the unincorporated county. Two of my children are grown now and luckily they avoided being addicted to nicotine and flavored tobacco products. We know that nicotine addiction usually starts when they're young. These days, they are enticed with sweet flavors of flavored tobacco products. It only takes a small observation to realize that the youth is indeed a great target audience for flavored tobacco products. Sadly and devastatingly, I lost my third child, Tessa Joy Davis, to a rare lung cancer when she was 18 years old, just months before her high school graduation. Her lung cancer was actually a non-smoking variety. She was a very straight kid and never imbibed in anything. And there's absolutely no explanation as to why she, as a healthy athletic child, got this cancer. But lung cancer took her fast, as it usually doesn't present symptoms until it is metastasized. She was diagnosed at 17 years old and passed away at 18. Needless to say, as you can tell, our lives are devastated, turned upside down, and the magnitude of her death has spread ripples of grief throughout the community and beyond. I can't bring Tessa back, but I can try and look out for the families and their children in the community. Parents in Santa Cruz County are busy to put food on the table. They're not necessarily aware of what is lurking in their near future or what's going on in the offices today here. We have to do everything we can to protect our children. 
Santa Cruz County needs to be a model for healthy place for children to grow. Four out of five kids have used tobacco, have started with a flavored product. Prohibiting the sale of flavored tobacco products is the most important thing we can do to halt the use of youth e-cigarette use. It's already in an alarming youth epidemic and we need to do everything we can to reverse it now. We need to have more people stand up and say no to the tobacco industry. This is how they get the next generation of people addicted Thank to their products. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I re thank you, and I'm sorry for your thoughts. We are listening. My name is uh, Nicholas Whitehead. I want to endorse the uh, statement of the previous, not the, the, woman, be the woman before that one. Uh, the, the county is heavily impacted by uh, serious use of extremely dangerous drugs, and um, I think it's time for all counties, all counties in California, to demand in a concerted way that the state provide extra resources to deal, deal with the uh, treatment and rehabilitation of serious and chronic drug addicts. If we don't do that, we're threatening, we're not protecting the public health. So please get together with other counties and bring that about. Um, on the issue of the wages of people who are doing this hard work at Janus Recovery System, I think it's pretty disgraceful that they earn so little for such highly skilled, delicate work, saving souls and bodies. Please find a way to um, subsidize their earnings. I think that's very necessary and humanly the fair thing to do. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Rachel Kippen. I'm the co-chair of the Santa Cruz County Tobacco Education Coalition. I'm grateful for your attention to this critical public health issue, and I want to particularly thank Supervisor Coonerty for initiating this effort. We're here today because California is facing a disturbing crisis of teen tobacco use. We've seen the rapid growth of electronic smoking devices and candy-flavored tobacco products that appeal to youth. Kid-friendly flavors such as chocolate, mint, and gummy bear make it easier for youth to start smoking and stay with it until they're hooked. In other words, they come for the flavors, but they get trapped by the nicotine. And it's not just electronic products. While overall cigarette use is declining in the United States, the youth of menthol cigarettes has increased, especially among young people and new smokers. Flavored little cigars, such as Swisher Sweets, are often sold for less than a dollar and promoted as low-cost alternatives to cigarettes. And smokeless tobacco use is particularly alarming among male high school and college athletes. That's why it's important that we include a broad range of flavored tobacco products in this ordinance. As we learned in 2009 when the FDA only banned flavored cigarettes, the tobacco industry will take lucrative advantage of any exceptions. The nicotine in all of these products is a neurotoxin that harms the developing brain and primes youth for addiction to both traditional cigarettes and other substances. The tobacco industry knows that the vast majority of addicted smokers start before age 18, so they need to get them young. This increases the risk of cancer, heart disease, emphysema, and other serious health problems. This generation, our county's youth, are the lab rats in this flavor experiment being run by Big Tobacco. Let's not wait until it's too late to recognize and fight back against the significant health, adverse health effects of these flavored products. The time to act is now. I encourage the County of Santa Cruz that deeply values the health and youth, the health and youth well-being to join the growing number of communities that have banned the sale of flavored tobacco products. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Council. My name is Michael McClellan. <clears throat> I'm the owner of Santa Cruz Vapors, and I got into vaping electronic cigarettes. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm nervous. I got into vaping um, and promoting electronic cigarettes six years ago when my mom died from lung cancer. She got lung cancer from traditional uh, combustible uh, cigarettes. Um, <clears throat> 
in my pocket, I have an electronic cigarette, and no part of this is tobacco. No part of this is from the tobacco leaf. That, that's great that the FDA waved a magic wand and declared this a tobacco product, even though it's not, so that I could be regulated. But I'm here to strongly urge you to reconsider the ordinance as it is um, and, and to consider an exemption for 21 and up establishments. Um, I get people off of cigarettes for a living. Um, and it would be next to impossible to do so if the only options we had was to offer them cigarette flavored, cigarette flavors. Um, this is actually um, a life saving technology. Um, and yes, there is alarming youth rates in when it comes to addiction and lots of other substances, that, uh, but they do not have access to those in retail environments. Um, we have flavored cannabis and flavored alcohol um, in 21 and up establishments um, on, a, on every other major thoroughway in the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz. That's why some of us chose to, some of us have chosen to do our business in the unincorporated area because we get a little bit more flexibility. And with our booming um, tourist industry that we've had the last couple of years, it just doesn't make sense when people come to Santa Cruz that they cannot get the, the nicotine delivery system or the flavors that's needed for them to have a full experience in Santa Cruz. So I know there's a big fear campaign going on around, around flavored tobacco products, but I, I hope that you'll consider looking past that and know that we need this to not be a cigarette smoker and to not die. Thank you. Good morning, City Council members. My name is Erica Baxter. I work for Pajor Valley Prevention Student Assistance as a program specialist where I go out to the PBUSD schools to present a tobacco prevention curriculum. We cover to topics such as substance abuse prevention and topics we start off with as a tobacco, e-cigarettes, and vaping as it catches, catches students' attention, especially the flavored tobacco products. Just last week at Watsville High School, when we presented on this topic, a student said his mouth watered as we showed them an image of a Fanta-looking e-juice, and sadly, youth do have access to these products. Not to mention, we have had a case as young as a third grader who had access to flavored tobacco products. So my point is, I hope we can all open our eyes to this epidemic because our youth are our future. Don't let them be the next generation of smokers. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Erica Trejo. I uh, work for Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. I'm the Tobacco Use Prevention Education Coordinator for our program. What that means is I have staff members that go out to uh, Pajaro Valley Unified School District schools and educate uh, children as young as third grade, fourth grade, I'm sorry, all the way up to um, 12th grade in high school. And so one of the things that we started seeing with our education efforts has been uh, an openness of students to talking about their use of vaping products. Um, it's very apparent. Schools are trying to find out how to handle this because it's such a huge issue. The number one clients for vaping companies are middle schoolers and high schoolers, okay? Flavors do attract them. Uh, flavors like Twinkie, flavors like gummy bears, those will attract kids. We've seen this with the tobacco companies. It's a huge strategy that they used, and we're seeing it replicated by the vaping companies. So the ban will allow for students who had never tradition, used traditional tobacco use to never get into the use of vaping products which have nicotine. Um, so I, I'm in support for the, for the ban, and I hope that you guys uh, support us as well. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for having us today. My name is Gina Cole. I am also a co-chair of the Santa Cruz County Tobacco Education Coalition. Um, as some of the previous speakers have uh, told you that we are doing a lot of education throughout the county. We have a very focused uh, practice in, in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Um, the Public Health Department's Tobacco Education and Prevention Program has been out in the schools with an education uh, middle and high school student. Um, 
the County Office of Ed has a TUPE program, which is the Tobacco Use Prevention and Education Program, where they're working on bringing in education from outside. We've been trained in the Stanford Tobacco Toolkit that is specific to um, vaping, traditional cigarettes as well as vaping. Um, the Sheriff's Department has uh, received funding to also increase compliance checks and to do education in the schools as well. Um, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, as these two ladies have said, are working very diligently in the PVUSD schools. Um, we also have the Boys and Girls Club, uh, Youth Now, and Salud y Carino that are working on this, this mission to educate our youth. Um, presentations only go so far. We can talk to the youth, we can talk to the youth, we can talk to their parents, and we can talk to students, but we still continue to get feedback from parents, we get feedback from schools um, all the time that say that we need another layer of protection for our youth. And I know we had youth that and, and educators that would have come today, but this isn't a convenient time for them. They're working and they're in school. Um, there is a difference between youth use and youth access, and I know that youth are not walking into a vape shop to get there, but they're to get a product, but they're getting it through older folks, and we need to a ban on the flavors in our county so that we can prevent that from happening. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. I first want to protest that public comment has been reduced to two minutes, already being compressed by 30% uh, combining items. I want to first uh, bring, uh, say that I am happy that the, on item number 59, that the Chanticleer bike pad overcross is going to happen. And I'm wondering when it's going to happen in Aptos for Mar Vista. That's been on the books for many, many years. I'm anxious to see that happen just as well. I'd like to discuss item number 46, the Memorandum of Understanding with the Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks. In reading the agreement, it um, looks like they would be paying $100 a month for use of a space at Suite 2 in the County Parks building at 17th Avenue, but it notes here that the building has no built-in heating or cooling system. How can that be? <laughs> I'm curious about that and would like to know more. Item number 47, um, I want to uh, uh, protest again that Measure G, this countywide sales tax, was sold as a way to support fire when fire will get zero, is what I'm hearing. And that's not right. You misled the voters. But I'm happy that money is going to the parks. and. Um, I'm happy that the um, farm park uh, contract is going to be given to a local company to do the bridge work, the pedestrian bridge work. That leads me to an article I saw in this morning's San Jose Mercury News that I really want to bring to your attention, and that's a discrepancy after an audit of the U.S. For, by the U.S. Forest Service of um, California State Fire Assistance Agreement. Uh, they are threatening to um, make the requirements for getting reimbursed by local fire agencies for firefighting at state and federal lands. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I'll just say that uh, Governor F uh, Senator Feinstein has sent a letter asking that um, these new requirements be waived. Can I have a little more time? Because I feel like I'm giving you some pretty critical information you need to weigh in on. No, everyone's going to get the same amount of time. Feel free to send us the article, and uh, staff is here can a can answer any of your questions you had about consent agenda items. This, this will severely impede local fire volunteers. That affects county. Thanks. Please send us the article or we'll look it up on our own. Thank you. Marilyn Garrett. Uh, two minute coonerty. <laughs> that's what you did at the Santa Cruz City Council, and that's what you're doing here. I think it clearly shows your contempt for public input or critiques of what you're doing, which of course is what is sorely needed. As I listen to people talk about uh, stopping cigarette smoking with uh, kids, I'm totally in agreement, and I, I think of, I'd actually like to ban the tobacco 
corporations and corporations that are causing harm. Um, but I think of an article called uh, Cell Phones, the New Cigarettes, because they're highly addictive. They cause cancer. People are developing brain tumors, salivary gland tumors, thyroid tumors, breast cancer, where they put the cell phone in their bra, uh, pro, uh, testicular cancer, digestive problems, all this from radiation. And here's some sources. Take back your power. Net, Dr. Magda Havas on YouTube videos on radiation, Dr. Barry Trower. Um, I'm going to give you a copy and recommend people see 5G Apocalypse, the extinction event. It starts out, it's important to understand what 5G is doing and what they say it's doing. We're told on the uh, IEEE beam forming doctrine that this technology cooks your eyes like eggs in World War II. We all need to understand these are military weapons. These are are assault frequencies. If you know nothing else than that, uh, you know it's microwave radiation weaponry. We need to stop this. I suggest you contact Renette Senum of the C City Council of Nevada City, who's working hard to stop 5G. Thank you. Buenos dias, good morning. I'm Teresa Cariño, Women's Commission District 1. Um, I'm also co-founder and director of Salud y Cariño. That's how you might know me, but today I'm here as a parent, uh, someone that works with youth, a community member, and a former smoker. I'll be 16 years quit this August, and it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, and I gave birth to twins. <laughs> <laughs> One of my twins is here today. She's a college student. She's on break. She got up early this morning. She doesn't want to come up and talk, but I want to point her out, Isabella Cariño. She, she feels so strongly about this that she wanted to come today even though she doesn't want to talk. I can tell you that from her and from the girls in our program, we know that kids as, as young as middle school are getting vape products. They are vaping at school. They're vaping in the restrooms. They're vaping during class and blowing the vape down their shirts. I'm totally against big tobacco, and big tobacco is getting smart. They know that half a million people are dying in the US from their products, so they're jumping on this bandwagon of using vapes. So we know that traditional smoking has gone down, but 48% of middle schoolers have used vapes, 78% of high school students, and 1.5 million more youth tried e-cigarettes in 2008 compared to 2017. I have a 19-year-old son who vapes, unfortunately. He has tried to quit numerous times. Um, he himself has gone into vape shops here in Santa Cruz and bought uh, vape products. So I, I highly, highly recommend this ban, and um, thank you for, your for, for giving me this time. Thank you. Good morning, my name's Elaine Narciso. I'm here with San Benito County Public Health Services. And I wanted to thank you for considering a flavored tobacco ban. The tobacco industry has found a way to hook new kids and that's through flavors. And we've seen that that's a problem at the federal, the state, and the local level. And as adults in our communities, it's our responsibility to do what's best for them. And from San Benito County and all the neighboring counties, we wanna thank Santa Cruz for their leadership in this fight against flavored tobacco. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Libby McCord. I just come to you as a parent. I have three kids. My youngest is 17. Uh, luckily, they, none of them vape yet, but I hope that they never do. Um, I urge you to um, ban these flavored products. We all know that um, nicotine is highly addictive. We all know people who are addicted. I just lost a friend who was addicted to nicotine. She was only 42, and she um, died of rep respiratory arrest. So. That couldn't have helped her. Um, so just, it's just a no-brainer to where the whole point of the flavored product is to bring young people in. That's the last thing we want. We, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good 
Gary Richard Arnold. I think it's outrageous that you jam all the programs so people only get two minutes of systematic shutting down of the people under Ryan Coonerty. I agree with the ladies about uh, this drug, uh, feeding the drug trade. Uh, the, you know, you're, you pretend that you're not liable. You pretend that you really care for children. And um, I, what I just handed to the Board of Supervisors is the forced vaccination, which they support. Very dangerous autism. My son's youngest daughter was hurt by vaccines. This goes on constantly. There is no, the pharmaceuticals aren't required to pay for the damage. It's the it's taxpayers to the federal government. Also, uh, you're running a attempt to create a parallel government. Bruce McPherson and Sam Farr and his assistants back in the 1990s was pushing regionalization. And we see from the, uh, uh, the state of Illinois, they're concerned about sovereignty and the powers and the duties of the state of Illinois to its people. They strongly emphasize uh, that they need to prevent the proliferation of regional governments, attempts to restructure state and local government. The first person that came up with this was Gary Patton a long time ago who supported the, the Soviet Union in Grenada, put airports, uh, bombers, and Russian ships there. Bruce McPherson has received tens of thousands of dollars from a red Chinese communist agent on the front page of U.S. News and World Report. Mr. Coonerty was graduated from the Fabian Socialist School whose emblem is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And they say they're going to do everything slowly and smartly but when they strike, they strike hard. This is their plan for regional government, and they've also created a power agency of which McPherson is involved in, and I don't know why a CAO of a county has time to split this. The man, the communications director is K.R. Gillibrew. He advocates a separate Soviet nation called Pacific. Can you restore my three minutes? No, you're going to go two minutes Well, like you didn't else. disclose that to members of the public. I did when I announced it. And then you allow all the design talkers and the functionary bureaucrats to stockpile the public comment to diminish uh, the American public's reclaiming their political community. You shouldn't be doing that. I find that very disrespectful. Not only uh, Zach Friend put a bullet in our public comment con condensing uh, the consent agenda, and you guys acquiesced to that, right? You just diminish us out. So what you're doing is you're committing a violent act against the American public, right? I want to be able to, this, I, I was not able to shower, so I threw this on my hat. I don't like to wear hats, but I came with the hat. But I want to share with members of the public my latest book, Why Be Jewish. And people that understand why be Jewish, right, understand this book, right? And Zach Fran, when I Googled him, Right, and I found out his name was Zachariah, and you know, I talked to him, and then he wanted to throw out uh, anti-Semitic. Right, I don't appreciate that, trying to vulgarize my, my interactions with you. So since you brought up the topic, I want to be able to go ahead and share with members of the public my latest book that I'm reading, uh, The Politics of Anti-Semitism. Right, a really good book, has a plethora of wonderful information, people can Google that. And also, this is a very banned book, it's called Bernard, uh, Bernard uh, Lazar, Anti-Semitism, It's History, and its causes. A really great book has a plethora of wonderful information because a change in language is a change in reality. You know, it's very shameful. We have only two minutes to do all this crap, right? And we got the we got Alan Timberlake and Emily Bolly right and her minions here to just uh, usurp all the benefits and privilege of government. Uh, yeah, I got it. But I want to be able to thank the sheriff department, uh, Jim Hart, for not stockpiling the public comment to diminish our time. These are this is a real institution that needs the public's help. Rather than just constantly stockpiling and pushing us all out, I think it's very disrespectful. The American public is not going to tolerate this. You're putting us in a bellicose frame of mind. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else like to speak to us today? That concludes public comment. Uh, I'll bring it back to the board for action on the consent agenda. These are items 15 to 62. Uh, and I'll start Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> item uh, 29, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome and congratulate Rosemary McNair as the fourth district appointee to the Housing Advisory Commission. Uh, we appreciate all the volunteers who serve on our commissions and I want to welcome her aboard. Uh, on item uh, 34, 
The uh, Encompass uh, Community Services, they do a lot of wonderful, wonderful work out in our community. Uh, the, the one question I have is uh, uh, the, the checks would be made payable to who? Uh, for the county to help them out right now. Uh, does anybody have that answer? No, it, the, the payments will be, will be to Encompass organization and they will be reconciled um, monthly. Okay, when you say reconciled, uh, we'll be overlooking how that money is spent. That is correct. But what about the rest of the money that they're spending? Who's overlooking that? Uh, yes, uh, Health Services Agency, the Human Services Department, those who have contracts with them oversee those contracts. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll go along with it, but uh, we need to uh, make sure that uh, it's not an ongoing problem in the future. Okay, thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of issues. On, on item 23, the uh, heap ca uh, cash um, issue, uh, I want to support these contracts for Cabrillo College, the Homeless Service Center, and the Housing Authority, but I want to make it clear that approving this item, uh, we're not approving the whole allocations list that's listed on uh, page one, or excuse me, 269 of the packet. And uh, I'll have some questions about the concerns about those allocations when they come back to us next month. Uh, item 26, I'm glad to see the next step uh, for the Nature Discovery Park that's going to be adjacent to the Felton Library. It's exciting that both the library and the park are going to be opening possibly at the same time, the first part of next year. Um, I want to thank the Public Works folks and the CO's office and the Felton Library friends for all their hard work on both of these projects. Um, it's going to be a, a real huge addition for the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, and item 28, the op or, um, I'd like to, the letter of opposition to the BLM proposal for, on offshore oil. I want to thank Supervisor Friend for bringing this item forward, and I was happy to sign on with it. Uh, this has been a 25-year effort to protect our sanctuary from oil gas leasing on the three-mile limit of the state oversight of our coastline waters. Um, also, in a combination of events, we have on uh, items 36, 39, 40, and 44 regarding regarding mental health and substance abuse. Uh, I'm glad to see these investments are being made in mental health and substance abuse. Um, they are very pressing items or issues in our county, especially how they impact the homeless who are in our county. And in order to for us to adequately address the homeless situation, we must be able to uh, address two of the biggest underlying causes in these. And I think uh, reference to these is a very good thing that we're taking action on. And it was mentioned by one of our uh, speakers, Sheila Delaney, earlier today on item 61, the recycling centers. Um, Gray Bears is being awarded the contract, and they are a great, it is a great organization, and I appreciate that they are working with the Valley Women's Club on a smooth transition, as was mentioned in the closing of the stations in Ben Loman and Felton. Um, I also want to thank our Public Works Department again for its efforts to streamline the uh, recycling services to address the big downtown downturn that has taken place in the market. Um, however, I'm still concerned about the loss of the CRV in the San Rosa Valley on the lower income residents, and uh, <clears throat> we'll keep an eye on that, and I, I know that Public Works is going to keep us an eye on the litter situation with the closure of these two recycling center uh, uh, posts in Felton and uh, Ben Lohman. So I just want to thank uh, the Valley Women's Club for its efforts throughout the years and for Gray Bears for and making this adjustment for including them and taking into consideration the employees at the, uh, the recycling centers that we had in the Valley. And uh, I think it's going to be a good transition and it probably could save the county about $250,000 a year in the, in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Just have a couple of items to comment on. On item 39, I want to express my appreciation to Health Services for providing more information about ways in which we might be able to use the 7th Avenue facility. I think it's a great opportunity for us to use a uh, local facility to meet uh, a local need and um, a reduced cost over time. Uh, on item number 40, I appreciate uh, this information about the drug Medi-Cal uh, system, this uh, report. Uh, I think we're in the early stages of this program, but what we can see is 
increased treatment slots um, uh, in lots of different ways. Uh, there's no guarantee a treatment slot uh, means a full recovery, but getting closer to being able to provide treatment on demand will make a big difference in being able to meet the public health needs of our community. And I appreciate the work that our health services agency uh, has done to build the capacity with our community-based uh, partners. On item number 46, I'm glad to see this uh, MOU with the Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks. Uh, the Friends is doing uh, some really good work uh, supporting uh, our youth and families and ensuring that there aren't barriers for people accessing programs uh, within the park system. And uh, I appreciate their, um, their volunteer commitment and the partnership they have with our parks department. Also on number 47, I'm glad to see us moving forward with the farm park phase two design. Uh, this has been, this park has been long talked about uh, and uh, with the support of Measure G, we're actually gonna be able to get some work done at this park. And I wanna thank parks for their ongoing commitment to making that happen. Lastly, on item number 61, I'm very uh, glad to see that Gray Bears is uh, poised to be awarded this contract for the recycling center operations. The Gray Bears has, uh, has been providing critical services for our community, not only in recycling services, but obviously in providing food services and support for our seniors. Uh, their expansion of their work uh, will allow them to continue to do that, and I hope that Public Works will continue to work with them to look about how to use the Chanticleer facility uh, as wisely as possible, both in the styrofoam recycling and in also the, uh, the waste uh, uh, recycling drop-off. I think there are still opportunities to expand the services at that site. But I appreciate the, the hard work that the Gray Bears put into putting together this, um, this proposal, and I'm glad to see we're awarding it to them. That's it. Supervisor Friend. Morning, Chair. Thank you. I'd like to first propose that we actually combine items 28 and 52, which basically deal with the exact same issue, which deal with uh, the administration's proposal on oil and gas leasing. Obviously, this board, this county, has been in opposition to uh, turning over our public and federal lands for such purposes. Uh, these recommendations, both from planning and from Supervisor McPherson and I, I think harmonize well, so I think that we should combine that into one item. I'd like to also comment on item 48 and thank Mr. Carlson for his work on the climate action strategy annual report, specifically your work with the Commission on the Environment and is trying to incorporate many of their suggestions for actionable items. Uh, it's, it's always sobering to see updates on this and we have a long way to go even locally on some of the work that we're doing. Lastly, on item 57, which is just simply a road closure for one of what will be a handful of events for the centennial of the cement ship. It doesn't quite look the same as it did maybe 100 years ago. Um, I probably won't look the same in 100 years either, but it is a very important legacy piece in Santa Cruz County, specifically in the second district. And if you have an opportunity to come out, I mean, a 100 year anniversary is a pretty remarkable uh, situation to come out and, and enjoy that before uh, it continues to turn into a reef. Uh, then I, I would highly recommend it. All right, thank you. And uh, so I have a couple comments and a couple additional directions. Uh, the first is on item number 23, which are the HEAP and CASH contracts for homeless services. I understand there's gonna be quarterly uh, outcome reports to the state uh, that are required, and I'd like to add direction for those quarterly reports to be circulated to the board as a non-agenda informational item and posted to the appropriate county webpage uh, when they're issued. On item number 25, which is emergency planning funds, I'd like to add a direction for staff to create a working group to analyze the county code with an emphasis on fire code, on the fire code to ensure that we're doing all we can within our authority to protect communities from catastrophic fire uh, and develop a clear line of responsibility for the enforcement of the fire code for residents residing in the CSA 48 uh, county fire area so the board and the public knows where the responsibilities are. And I recommend that the working group report back to the board in uh, August or September of this year. I want to thank um, uh, my colleagues on for item number 28 and the planning department for item number 52, uh, which is regarding the BLM's proposal for oil and gas le uh, leasing. Um, this has been a long ongoing effort and I'm glad that we're able to push back against the Trump administration's efforts to, um, to undermine uh, our local laws and, our, and uh, contaminate our environment. 
And item number 26, which is the Felton Library Park, I want to congratulate Supervisor McPherson and all the residents uh, in the Valley who collaborated to make this great project possible. And then finally on item number 40, which is a drug Medi-Cal report, um, I want to pre appreciate the report and as my, my colleague said, we're at the beginning of a process, but it's critical that we provide these services. And I'd like to add direction that future reports regarding drug Medi-Cal include the number of clients who completed treatment uh, and the number of nights that residential treatment beds went unfilled, and then also that they develop a uh, system to track the number of clients who remain sober six months post-treatment um, so that we can uh, make sure we're seeing that these, uh, that these, this facility and resources, uh, facilities and resources are used to the best extent uh, to help people uh, through recovery. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Chair. I did, there's one, um, I misspoke, I, I accidentally said Ben Lohman was going to, to uh, close. Uh, that's the transfer station that is going to stay open. The recycling centers in Boulder Creek and Felton uh, are the ones that are going to be closing in this. Uh, Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Chair, uh, on your uh, on your last uh, direction, I just want to get clarity uh, from staff. Uh, I support the idea of understanding whether six months after they receive treatment, if they're sober. I just don't know what if that's already something we do, or that's an additional cost and how we would pay for it. I don't know whether staff could to just uh, quickly answer that. Good morning, Shane Azarlin, Chief of Substance Use Disorder Services with County Behavioral Health. To answer your question, we have since the last um opportunity that, that Supervisor Coonerty had to request that we look at the six-month uh, post-treatment outcomes. We've taken a number of steps to move towards this and found it to be very problematic. One of the things we did was contact ASR and secure um, some kind of bid to see what we would need fiscally to make that work out of house. One of the problems in having our existing providers to um, gather that data is it's very labor intensive and it would therefore take away from the time and energy that they have to provide the direct services. Um, I also spent some time with our public health epidemiology team looking at how we could track this um, and it is a really a challenging measure um, so one of the things that we're proposing is that public health uh, epidemiology team develop a pilot project so that we can pull a subsect of folks um, try to track them probably more like three or four months out because the longer we get out the harder it is to, to sort of identify where folks are and, and get that information um, and see for the labor that goes into um, tracking those folks down and, and getting that data what kind kind of outcomes and numbers we actually get back, what percentage of folks we're able to contact, and then use that pilot information to make a decision about how to go forward. Yeah, I appreciate that, and as I say, I support the goal of my uh, colleague. Maybe uh, if my colleague would be okay is that we have that come back during our budget discussion, because if there's a, if there's a financial implication with it, I think that would be the appropriate place to discuss it. Um, uh, I, I feel sort of uncomfortable agreeing to something that I don't know how much it's going to cost and what benefit it will be. Sure. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's why I, I added the develop a system, because I thought um, it wasn't clear what the the method by which we do. I think it's vital that we know whether we're having, if we're investing millions and millions of dollars, mm -hmm. uh, that we know whether it's working. Sure. Uh, and six months is a relatively short period of time to to track somebody. Uh, and so um, I'm okay if it comes back if, uh, as a proposal during budget time. Uh, so I'll amend that, my that, my direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, <laughs> not a question. Uh, just item uh, 44. I wanted to. I'm sorry, I didn't comment earlier. Uh, that's uh, <clears throat> to submit a Mental Health uh, Services Act Proposition 63 grant to the California Veterans Affairs, and. Uh, this is a very uh, important part of our veterans outreach program and uh, I f there's a certain date and that uh, happens to be this year, June 25th. And one year I believe we missed uh, the Human Services Department, missed the application about six years ago. And if you're a day late, uh, you lose it. So I'm glad we're on top of this, and we have been for the past uh, six years, uh, making sure that that application is in on time. 
and this is an outreach worker that deals with homeless veterans and deals with college uh, student veterans and uh, is uh, it's a very uh, important part of our uh, program working with veterans so anyway it's a it's a wonderful uh, grant and it's pretty much an automatic grant if you get the application in on time so thank you okay great so uh, I'd entertain a motion now I'm sorry I'm sorry before you do that can we get clarification on what the additional direction is for number 40 so uh, I was about to give I was gonna give it to you written down but it's uh, the additional direction is that future reports regarding drug medical include the number of clients who completed treatment and the number of nights that residential treatment beds went unfilled and then additionally to bring back uh, during budget discussions a uh, system or a pilot to track uh, the number of clients who remain sober six months post treatment. Thank you. Uh, any uh, any motions? I would uh, move the consent agenda as amended. Okay, I get a motion by Leopold, a second by McPherson. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, we're now going to move on to uh, item number seven, which is a presentation by the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, CAB, uh, on the uh, purpose, process, and findings of CAB's Community Action Plan, as outlined in a memorandum of the Director of Human Services. Good morning, Chair Coonerty, members of the board. I'm Ellen Timberlake, the Director of the Human Services Department, and I am honored this morning to introduce my colleagues from the Community Action Board who are here this morning to present to your board the results and the findings of their comprehensive community action plan, an equity-based approach to addressing poverty. And I think when you hear this presentation, you will be as excited and impressed as we are. Um, I don't want to steal their thunder, but what I I will say is working with the Community Action Board um, is just um, a, a distinct pleasure for our department, for our county. They're a leader in the county, they're a leader in the region, in the state, and the work that they have done through this planning process has informed our county strategic planning process as well as is informing our approach to the Census 2020. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Batley, who is a member of the board and also the uh, chair of the Advancement Committee, and he will in turn introduce other colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I want to thank um, Supervisors Capic, McPherson, Leopold, and Friend, and uh, Chairman Coonerty for giving me the opportunity to be the county at large um, board member of um, the uh, Community Action Board, and I would like to introduce um, fellow uh, board members, Jaime Molina, who is uh, Public Health, um, Aurelio Gonzalez, who is representative of the City of Watsonville, Christine Pearson, who is um, the City of um, Capitola, and Ryan Coonerty, who is on the board um, as uh, the county representative. Um, one thing I would like to say um, is that if you hadn't already heard, May is the Community Action um, Month nationally. So um, I uh, really want to thank all of you for your leadership in providing um, us getting back to the community and providing for the needs of all members of the community. And uh, that is a, an important job, and I uh, thank you all for that. I'm going to introduce Christine Pearson to um, continue. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Kristen Peterson uh, and I thank you all for having us today and for the work that you all do uh, individually and collectively for our community. Um, I'd like to start this off with a quick explanation of the outcomes we're hoping for today's presentation. We'd like to talk to you today about the community actions, uh, community action plan process the principles that we used and what we learned from that process. Uh, what we learned can be found in our community action plan. I've brought copies for each of you today and it can also be found on our website, uh, cabinc.org. 
We'd also like to talk with you about our alignment of community-wide strategic planning efforts. We know that the county has uh, is also action-oriented and brought several other nonprofits to the table in their own strategic planning process to address issues of equity and how to support low-income communities. Finally, we'd like to discuss implementation of our community action plan and recommendations to move the conversation forward and how to support equity in our community. The mission of the Community Action Board is to partner with the community to eliminate poverty and create social change through advocacy and essential services. Our vision is a thriving, equitable, and diverse community free from poverty and from injustice. Our values include equity, dignity, and diversity, service, community action, and inclusion. As many of you may know, Santa Cruz County has the second highest poverty rate in all of the state, second only to Los Angeles County. And here in Santa Cruz County, the Community Action Board serves 7,000 to 10,000 people per year through our programs. Our programs include those that uh, are aimed towards homelessness prevention and essential services, such as the Rental Assistance Program, or RAP, our CalWORKs Emergency Payment Program, our Immigration Legal Assistance and citizen Citizenship Services, such as the Santa Cruz County Immigration Project, our Youth Adults Employment and Reentry Services through Alcance and the Day Worker Center, and our Community Building and Youth Development Services, such as those we provide at the Davenport Resource Service Center. Uh, to share a little bit more with you about our Community Action Board, I would like to welcome our uh, Assistant Executive Director, Helen Ewan Story. Good morning, Supervisors. Um, as many of you know, the Community Action Board was created in 1965 as part of the Federal War on Poverty. We're the designated Community Action Agency for our county, and we're part of a statewide and a national-wide network of Community Action Agencies. Um, what sets Community Action apart from other nonprofits are two primary factors, one of which is that we have a tripartite board, and so we have equal representation from the low-income, public, and private sectors on our board. And we're uh, mandated to create a community action plan every two years where we go out in the community and listen to how folks are being impacted by poverty. And the last few years, we've really been engaged in changing that conversation. And our objectives for changing that conversation include through cultural humility and respect, creating an inclusive model of community engagement that moves beyond traditional data collection and needs assessment to involve those most affected by poverty and are often unheard in these processes. And so another goal for us was to expand the view from beyond just purely needs and a deficit focus to include community identified assets, resources, and networks as part of the community's solution to poverty. And I'd like to invite uh, Tom Batley back up to continue the next slide. So um, in this, uh, uh, new process, um, we uh, developed um, different plans to reach out to the community that uh, haven't been heard and give them the opportunity to give us feedback so that we understand what is happening. This included 11 uh, listening circles, nine pop-up poverty conversations, 53 community partner and 49 client surveys, and one public forum uh, with over 400 voices. And the people that we included in this were seniors, LBGTQ+, incarcerated voices, indigenous voices, youth and young adults, immigration, day workers, and DACA, uh, participants, faith community, Lat Latinx activists, um, service providers, partners, and community experts. Um, one of the other um, aspects of this conversation that hadn't been developed in the past was the fact that we ask about assets that the, these members have in the community that allow them to survive. And uh, those assets include community, family, and pride, services in the community, spiritual relation, wealth, and knowledge of legal rights and services. 
and the needs that we uh, learned about came out to be a no-brainer. Jobs, higher wages, and consistent employment, housing, insecurity, and high rent burden, so housing quality. Barriers to access of resources, such as childcare, transportation, and education. And um, uh, the health needs of physical, mental, and substance use and food. But the, uh, one thing that uh, surprised us was the impact of discrimination, prejudice, and stereotypes. And I wanted to thank you all for uh, leading the, the uh, charge to um, change that. And uh, I'm going to introduce Mary Elena de, de la Garza, our um, executive director. Buenos dias, good morning, it's good to be here and thank you for the time on the agenda. Um, I'd like to just point your attention to um, our branding effort, we call it our flower, which includes our needs and our assets that we learned about as we engage the community in a different way and I'd like to add that we were the only community action agency in the nation that requested and, and engaged in the community in this way and, and were able to, to work with the community to learn about their assets and we reported it to the state which went up to the feds, and so we're trying to include the assets as part of our conversation nationally. Um, some of the messages that we heard for decision makers, and 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 y y you know, community action. Um, we have we hold a very unique position where we stand between um, uh, uh, systems that that exist to help provide support and our grassroots partners, and we take that position very seriously. And so we wanted to bring back to you some of the quotes that people shared with us. So we need more low-income housing. Necesita planes de desarrollo más justos. We need more of just uh, uh, development plans. We need to provide jobs locally. Um, que sean influenciados por las realidades del pueblo, no por las políticas, to be impacted or influenced by the reality of the people rather than politics. Um, create alliances between voters and those who cannot vote. All that is happening now politically is affecting our children. They are scared and they are stressed. And one very powerful quote that I want to share with you is, prefiero morirme de hambre que pedir ayuda. I would prefer to die of hunger than to ask for help. Um, very powerful messages to you and to us as a community. Um, in the next slide, we'd like to show, and, and we're very grateful for the work that the county has initiated in creating our first strategic plan. We've been very cl uh, clear, uh, cl close partners in helping support that work. And we wanted to show you um, through this slide is how we are in alignment with the work of the strategic plan countywide. Um, you can see from the, the countywide trends and our needs assessment assessment where we're aligned, housing, economy, and health. Very clear that the folks that we engaged with are telling us the same message as the folks that you've been engaged with in the, in the countywide strategic planning process. In the next slide, you can see um, uh, we've also been partners with you uh, and our county staff to talk about CORE and the conditions for health and well-being. It's been a long and important conversation and systems change conversations. And we wanted to show you how, again, our community action plan and the folks that we serve in the community, how their voices align with the conditions of health and well-being. And so you can see that there's overlap um, in both needs and assets. The green one are our needs, housing, health and wellness, equity and jobs, and the orange ones are our assets, community support, and family support. So again, another example of how our community engagement process is supporting the core work in the county. Um, the, the, this information landed in a very um, a critical space for CAB. We are doing some important internal conversations and there's a lot of shifts that are happening within the agency on all levels of the agency. But we wanted, but this work mostly came out uh, for us as a community action invitation. It's like, what do we do with this work? We understand that alignment, as we just looked at through the previous slides, um, that we need to seek alignment and collaborate with equity building and 
initiatives and not to be afraid, and, and I'll tell you in the last two years, supervisors, we're not afraid of using the word equity and it's coming up on all tables and so I'm really grateful for our community to have the courage to have that conversation. Building and supporting equity to help conditions to help advance folks in, in, in the areas of equity and of course connection to the community, drawing and building on community input and taking steps to support and grow community engagement in all processes and the importance of accountability for that where you as the leadership need to hold us accountable and how we connect and engage with the community in our work. So with that, I'd like to bring our um, board member, Jaime Molina, who holds the health seat on the Community Action Board. Good morning. Um, so I wanted to just kind of point this out that, um, you know, it, awareness is the first step towards change. And so I know that I'm kind of talking to the to the experts and, and to people who have been here for, for a while that, like myself, been part of this county for many years. So I want us to, I want to just invite people to kind of emphasize that the need to, uh, we, we trust and we go by fairness and equality, but we need to have more of a equity-based approach in how we look at the, the current needs that, um, that we that we face to continue to assess and address what is what is uh, affecting our poverty rates. What is it that the county and our community partners are, are doing to advance equity? Um, so I want to um, kind of consider help you or invite you, I should say, to consider the lens that we need to uh, emphasize and look at, which is the the cultural humility lens, because um, being part of the county and being part of of this great community, I've learned that the experts are the community themselves, the family, the people who live in, in those situations. And so it's important for us to continue to honor, acknowledge, and, and validate their experience because they're the ones that are gonna inform us how, is, how it is to live, the, to live in that reality. The other thing is uh, what we talk about, co political courage, which helps us to go beyond uh, what we think is, is good practice but really to acknowledge that we need to continue, continuously assess and reevaluate how our efforts and, and with the best intentions are really addressing the, the reality or wh how are we moving closer to the solution. And so uh, this lens has to do with uh, the cultural humility, the political courage, but as we know, we can talk about it, but unless we have a, a, a an action plan, which I keep hearing, it feels good to know that there's a plan already in place that is that is in, in motion. And so we can talk about and understand and be aware of how cultural humility and political courage is, is essential, but unless we go to the next step, it's, it's just gonna be short-lived. Uh, so cultural humility, what we're talking about, is really creating and supporting standards for diversity. Um, Across the county, including how, uh, one of the things that I pride myself is uh, really being connected and engaged with the community. It's not doing things with the, with the community, it's actually doing things alongside the community rather than for them. In the CAB, uh, it was mentioned before that the CAB 2019-2020 process, we need to continue to expand poverty snapshots from the needs focus to include community identified assets. As we know, the assets are there. We just need to um, tap into that. And so the political courage, uh, these are just some of uh, the things that as I was mentioned by Marilena or Kristen that this is what we heard, this is what we know, this is what we need to consider is really looking at uh, some recommendations to assess how we can build equity and diversity in, in existing systems. I know that uh, being part of uh, national movements, Santa Cruz is ahead of the game in many respects, but we need to continue to reevaluate ourselves and reassess how is it that we're promoting or we're kind of contributing to the solution rather than just identifying things. Um, and continue to explore inno innovative practices in county structures and build accountability. And so one of the things that, that we want to say for a um, turn it over, is what about having an equity plan? I know that we have many commissions, I'm actually part of the, the commission uh, of District 4, but what about an equity commission? What about have we considered, uh, like other counties, having equity officers? 
that helps us move this along and keep it on, on the forefront. And uh, as other uh, sites have uh, pointed out, there's uh, such a thing as a poverty task force. And I think it's, uh, those are things that are recommended that we need to consider. Thank you very much. Um, and so as Jaime um, eloquently uh, discussed, you know, p having political courage and having cultural humility under an equity lens um, only gains strength if we have action, um, actions behind it. And Kristen and I just came back from Sacramento um, where we had the privilege to listen to our state controller and our um, Department of Health and Human Services Secret Deputy Secretary. We wanted to share some of the actions and some of the conversations that are happening on the state level um, because it's pertinent locally. Um, um, and, and really pertinent to this conversation. And so some of the recommendations in terms of actions, and, and I hope that you have heard about this specifically, um, there's conversations about creating a statewide plan to el eliminate deep poverty in four years. And they're creating these conversations now and our, and, and our invitation as community action and as our leadership, our local leadership, to be part of those conversations so that we help define what deep poverty is and define those strategies that will impact folks. I mean, that's a bold action. Eliminate deep poverty in four years. Uh, we also learned and, and support uh, the need to continue support for the earned income, um, excuse me, the earned income tax credit, as well as continuing momentum for the 2020 census. Um, I'm sure that you've heard our message and, and uh, share our message of how important it is to ensure that every one of us is counted, um, not only for funding for our region, but also for representation. Um, we were invited to explore base, universal basic income as an anti-poverty strategy. We had a discussion around recognizing the connection and impact between environment, climate change, and poverty. Um, we ask you to support diversification in all levels of local leadership, like boards, commissions, councils, and management, and having the, the boldness to um, help support people who n not normally sit in these positions to have support and, and access to these positions. Uh, and finally, uh, the support and investment in wage equity across sectors is another very vital aspect of action that can be taking, taken now. We want to thank you all again so much for inviting us here today to share this uh, community action plan and the work that Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County is doing. Um, and, and we hope that you will continue to partner with us as your community action agency as we move forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Does anyone like have any questions? Do any board members have any questions? Well, no, no questions. I just want to thank the Community Action Board for its services since 1965. Uh, it's been phenomenal. I hate to think of where thousands of our residents in Santa Cruz County would be without it and the focus of attention that you have had on it. And there's a couple things, uh, the communications, uh, accountability, uh, the alignment with our strategic plan. Uh, we're, I, I want, want you to have confidence that I believe every member, I know that every member of this board is on the same page with you. Uh, we have take, we take actions uh, day in and week in and week out to try to uh, build that and your new program of work I think is going to put a renewed, uh, shall I use the word focus again on having us get there. So I do appreciate your dedicated efforts to do this. Uh, what you've done already has helped thousands of people in Santa Cruz County throughout the years. And we're going to do, and, and you, with your help, we're going to be able to do a better job because of your plan of attack here and your, your um, understanding of what, what really are the needs of those who are in most need in Santa Cruz County. So I appreciate the years that you've put into this, and it's going to give us a great platform to move ahead in the years ahead. Mr. Caput. You bet. Yeah, you're doing wonderful work, and uh, it's uh, it's great to see your involvement in South County, where we have uh, you know the highest uh, poverty rate in the county, and maybe one of the highest uh, in the state of California. So, um, your uh, programs uh, they're you know, wonderful, and uh, and I want to congratulate you on everything you're doing. I would I would give a word of caution. You have expanded uh, quite a bit in the last couple of years, and uh, you have to really watch how you spend your money and make sure you balance your budget 
because we've seen that happen. Some nonprofits where they get going too far out and then uh, they can't pay the bills. So, uh, you know, be, just be careful. I know you have good people on your board and they're looking over that and, uh, and everything. Uh, real quick, I know you're working with uh, uh, probably with the, the getting people to uh, cooperate with the census. <clears throat> I have checked uh, starting this week, uh, later, I think, Right, right about now, they're taking applications for census takers. Uh, they pay $20 an hour and about 50 cents a, a, a mile for, uh, uh, for driving uh, gasoline uh, allowance. And uh, flexible hours, uh, meaning you can go full-time or part-time. <laughs> and you have that phone number to, and they can also do it online. So uh, keep up the good work and uh, I'm trying to see if there was anything else. Uh, immigration services going okay in Watsonville? Excellent. All right, thank you. Special Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I, I really appreciate uh, the ongoing work of the Community Action Board. You've been a great partner with the county, um, the, not only uh, through different programs, uh, a, a longstanding partner, but in new programs. And you know, you're our partner with the complete count uh, efforts, and I thank you for that. But I also really appreciate your commitment to engaging the public not just being a group of smart people on a board trying to determine what's best for the community, but uh, effectively engaging with uh, members of our community uh, to, to find out what's going on and to share that and build plans to be able to support them. Um, you know, when I look at the list of, of items that you heard with the state, uh, some of them we can do here in the county, some of them are uh, state responsibilities, but it, it, it serves as a good uh, guide for us for things that we need to be thinking of uh, here. So I appreciate it, and I appreciate that you keep a uh, laser focus on, on, on the issues of poverty, uh, because we know it's, um, the war might have started uh, uh, in 1965 officially, um, it's not something that's, that, we, uh, that we can ever declare victory because there's always work to be done with the most vulnerable in our community. You're committed to doing that. I, I appreciate the work of the board, uh, uh, my elected official partners who will serve on the board and give their time to help make this work, and the staff and all the programs. You, you, the, the work you're doing is critical for our community. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I just want to take a moment to recognize the, that novel approach that you mentioned where you're not only outlining the needs but also the resources and the strengths of our community. Um, in doing that one, you're inviting the voice from the community to talk about what they're bringing, which I think is incredibly powerful and important. And two is, uh, you know, there's two ways to fix problems. One is to identify the problems and try to solve them. The second way is to identify the strengths and try to build on them. And I think that, um, once again, you're not only a local leader, but you're a national leader, uh, and I'm grateful for your for your for your leadership. And I hope I hope community action boards around the country, and uh, in fact, our many of our government policymakers follow your example, because I think it's it's the right thing to do. Um, so thank you for the presentation, uh, and um, keep up the good work. Uh, it's never ending. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Our applause for Community Action Board. Uh, so now we're going to move on to item number eight. This is to consider an, an ordinance repealing chapter 7.89 and 7.114 of the Santa Cruz County Code and amending chapter 5.60 related to the sale of tobacco products and the use of tobacco vending machines in the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County and schedule the ordinance for a second reading and final adoption on June 11th as outlined in a memorandum of the Director of Health Services. Uh, so now we're going to have a presentation. It's time. Are you going? to allow public comment on item number seven? Uh, sure, would you like to thank you. say something? My name is Becky Steinbrenner and I also want to thank the people who just left the room. But what I want to say to you as our leaders is that um, I think what they had to say is really uh, indicative of, of where we are as a county. It, it's startling to me to hear that uh, our county is second highest in the state for poverty. That, that was shocking to me after L.A. 
That's shocking <laughs> and sobering. So um, I, I applaud these good people for their efforts. I'm sorry they're not here, but um, I really applaud them too for involving the youth. And you as leaders need to do that too. The youth is tomorrow, and this group in their presentation talked a lot about uh, political courage, and we've got to give our youth the encouragement to stand up and speak out for the future. I also want to encourage you as our leaders to take what they're saying to heart, and as assets, one of the biggest assets is the sense of community, watching over one another, those connections. One of the things that promotes that in local neighborhoods is community gardens that also helps provide people with a way to raise their own food, and that is empowering. So in your leadership, I would like to ask that you use Quimby Act funds that are collected from developers to create more community gardens to bolster this asset that will help, as you said, strengthen what we have. I would also like to say that I really think this is indicative of our infrastructure problems. People who live in the South County because of housing have a difficult time and an expensive time getting to where the jobs are in other parts of the county. Our infrastructure is broken, and I hope you as leaders will help fix it to address the issues that these good people have brought up that will help our society as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we'll move on to item number eight, uh, and uh, I've already read in the, uh, the item, and I'm going to ask Mimi Hall and our um, uh, health director to make a presentation. I will say a number of people uh, in the audience, we're grateful for your, present for your participation, already spoke on this item, so when it comes time for public participation, we ask that those who haven't spoken to this item, uh, please, please feel free to do so. Good morning, Chair Coonerty. Honorable members of the Board of Supervisors, I'm Mimi Hall, Director of the Health Services Agency. I'm pleased to be here today. I'm joined by Andrea Solano, who is um, in our Community Health Education Unit and Director of Project Director for our uh, programs. And I'd also like to note that uh, today we also have joining us uh, Sheriff's Deputy Damon Hancock, who uh, provides. Uh, the enforcement activities for our youth decoy operations in case you have any law enforcement questions, he is available as well. Um, so today we're here to discuss an amendment to the Santa Cruz County Tobacco Retail License. <coughs> we were asked by the board back in March to return and report out on the issue and also with a draft ordinance. Damn. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so just a very brief history on tobacco retail licenses in uh, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County and our related cities. Uh, we are a leader in tobacco control. We have led the way by, um, in August 2010, the city of Watsonville enacted the first tobacco retail license in the county. Uh, county of Santa Cruz joined that uh, about a year later in 2011, and the city of Santa Cruz uh, followed suit just several months later. Very recently, in November of 2018, the city of Santa Cruz enacted a total ban on flavored tobacco products, and that's going to go into effect January 1st, 2019. So our, oh, I'm sorry, 2020. Excuse the typo. So we are deemed as a model program, and the, uh, the, the ordinances that we have implemented have been uh, proved as such by the California Department of Public Health. So it's clear that our city and county jurisdictions value the health of our public and have taken steps in, um, in the policy arena to continue the protection of the public. Je I don't know how many of you are familiar with, um, with electronic devices and other kinds of technology to deliver nicotine in a flavored manner. I'm familiar with it from my work as a public health uh, practitioner. I'm also familiar it with it in my role as a mother of three teenagers. Um, so flavor has met technology very recently. And um, in the old days, in, in the days when I was a youth, we had menthol cigarettes. Today we have little cigars, cigarillos, which are um, very affordable, <coughs> sold in um, small quantities. Smokeless tobacco now comes in numerous flavors. 
there are hookah pipes. I don't know if any of you are familiar with those, but we use water to uh, suck the flavor of the tobacco out. And the most popular now, uh, which is really impacting youth uptake, is um, e-cigarettes or cartridges to uh, vaporize the nicotine product. So you can see from this photo that vape pens are, they look very much like regular pens. Um, my former board of supervisors, I used to have my box, it's called a pencil box, and I had pens, pencils, and uh, tobacco delivery devices or nicotine delivery devices. And my board of supervisors could not pull out, after careful examination, uh, the nicotine delivery devices, the vape pens, from the real pens. Uh, there you'll see one of the popular devices, which is a jewel, and it's about the size of a memory stick. So why do flavors matter? As many of the folks who spoke during public comment today, four out of five kids who have used tobacco started using tobacco with a flavored product. It's clear that the tobacco industry reaches out and markets to children. Just showing you some examples, if you haven't seen them, uh, you can see that these products, their packaging is marketed, marketed to look like existing uh, candy or cereal products that kids are already extremely familiar with. Here's another example, looks like a blow pop, um, and then also a Snickers flavor. So um, I know that there is a sentiment that uh, flavored tobacco, especially uh, in, in vapor form, is a quick device. But what we do know is the evidence is not yet out on the health dangers of vapored tobacco products. This is just a list of a small portion of the chemicals found in vape aerosol, including acetone, valeric acid, arsenic, chromium, heavy metals, polypropylene glycol. Um, some of you may know that as antifreeze. It's the main ingredient in antifreeze. And then there are other kinds of products like glycerin, which have been approved in soap or to, um, to use on your face, but um, they ha it hasn't been studied in terms of heating the product and inhaling it. Diacetyl, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of popcorn lung. It is a lung condition that's very serious and could be fatal, and um, the cause of it is diacetyl, and diacetyl is found in 75% of uh, vaping products. So just to show how vaping uh, nicotine products is different and more addictive than regular tobacco, one pack of cigarettes. The average pack of cigarettes has about 20 milligrams of nicotine, the equivalent of about one milligram per cigarette. One jewel pod has the equivalent nicotine of about 41 cigarettes. And two other brands that uh, there are also popular fix in Soren pods, 75 milligrams of nicotine and 90 milligrams of nicotine. They're also easier to use. You can suck on it several times a day. It's rather easy. Um, and, and the point of this is that these products expose the people who are using them to a higher level of nicotine. It increases their tolerance, and it actually speeds up the addiction process and results in addiction uh, sooner and probably more likely than if you only had access to nicotine through cigarettes. So in Santa Cruz County, um, this is what's happening in our county. E-cigarette availability in stores increased 57% between 2013 and 2016. And 63% of our tobacco stores sell flavored non-cigarette tobacco products. And we found them in flavors such as grape, watermelon, and gummy bear. 84% of stores sell menthol cigarettes. And um, that's important to note because of the uh, kids who, 12 to 17, who actually smoke cigarettes, uh, almost 60% of them smoke menthol cigarettes. It kind of uh, dulls the tobacco flavor uh, in the product. 60% of stores near schools also sell flavored non-cigarette tobacco products. And 16% of our stores have been found to place tobacco ads in kid-friendly locations and then uh, lower at eye level for small children and near candy and toys. So um, our, our landscape in Santa Cruz County has changed. 
Across California, this is a huge problem. And um, we, if we pass this flavored ban ordinance, we will be joining total flavor bans in 25 other jurisdictions. There are four jurisdictions that have flavored tobacco bans in school buffer zones. And then there are six jurisdictions that have tobacco only store exemptions. Um, there are also a number of other kinds of variations of, uh, of restrictions on flavored tobacco. So today's amendment before you really has four main components. The first one is to strengthen the core tobacco retail license provisions that already exist. Um, the second major change is uh, aligning the ordinance that we adopted previously with the new state law because as some of you may know, the new state law requires that you must now be 21 years old rather than 18 to purchase tobacco. Uh, the third change in the amendment is that uh, the self-service display and vending machine provisions that were previously a different portion of the tobacco retail license ordinance are now integrated into Chapter 5.60. And then finally, uh, this ordinance will provi prohibit the sale of all flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes. And that's the end of my brief presentation. I hope I've given you information on the background of uh, the amendment and you have the uh, language of the proposed amendment changes before you. Great. And I'll ask if any supervisors have any questions. Yeah, I just, uh, Christian. Um, the, the, can you tell me, that we had a, um, a decoy to, with tobacco real, uh, real, uh, retailers. What were the results of that? Uh, do you know how, how many arrests or how many, how, what percentage of those that were investigated? Yeah. Uh, so um, our youth decoy operations conducted by the sheriff's office began very recently. I believe it was in January of this year. And um, they're conducted as a result of the grant that the sheriff's office had. Um, I, I don't have a formal report, but what I do have are um, two violations that we've gone to court or hearings for, four more that um, we have to move forward with. And I can um, ask Deputy Hancock if he has anything to add. My point is people, uh, retailers are selling tobacco to minors. Good morning. Uh, we've operated approximately six decoy programs throughout the county, as well as a couple that have been co-opted to assist Capitol and, and working with Santa Cruz City as well. Of those, we cited, I believe it was five different locations uh, for selling to decoy. In addition, the state tobacco program also uh, ran an operation that was conducted through Santa Cruz City and then entered Santa Cruz County as well. Uh, during their operation, there was an additional two violations, one in the county as well as one in the city. Okay, uh, what are the fines associated with that? I mean, is it, the, the amount that they sell, do they have a bigger fine, or is it just that it's cut and dried if you sold it uh, to minors, um, the, the fine is structure? What, what is the fine structure? Is there a basic fine structure? There's a couple different applications to that, sir. Um, there's both Stake Act law, which is based on financial. Uh, I believe the, the series of fines run as like 100, 300, 500. Then there's also a uh, business profession code, also again, very similar to the Stake Act uh, with a similar uh, structure as well. And then there's also <clears throat> the additional retailer fine, which is finding the actual retailer or the clerk that uh, sells to the decoy or an underage individual. Thank you. Uh, just one other quick question. Um, we received a number of letters from the Community Prevention Partners, Tobacco Education Coalition, PV, uh, uh, PSA, um, school board members, uh, nurses, school nurses. Um, do we have a list of all the people who've who've written us in support of this, um, uh, of, in support of this ban? Yes, we have a we have an ongoing list. Oh. You, you, you turn on the green light on the bottom. <laughs> yes, we have an ongoing list of folks that have submitted letters or intend to submit letters. Okay. Uh, and you don't have that list available for us, right? Um, I have a list. I'm not sure if it's the most current list. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Cabot? You bet. Thank you. Uh, I am for most of this. Uh, the only problem I'm having here is... Um, 
we have to be consistent. We're, we're talking about uh, uh, tobacco flavored, uh, you know, products and uh, we, all, we have a related uh, item on our uh, agenda today with cannabis and I, I hear arguments uh, with cannabis, the more you, in the past when it was uh, illegal or whatever, uh, marijuana, the more we pushed on it and made it illegal and everything and it went underground and it got out of control and now, now we're being more and more lenient with uh, cannabis. Uh, everything that they, a lot of the things that they sell is flavored, right? Uh, they have uh, gummy bears, uh, they have all this stuff that, that we're mentioning here in cigarettes. And we're not going to, we're not going to eliminate uh, kids and people from using the product by putting more and more restriction on it. Uh, we can have restriction, but I'm getting at the point of we should, we should be consistent. We got to treat them both the same. 600 foot buffer I'm for in this and I'm also for it in uh, uh, marijuana. Uh, and that we have on the agenda today to change. So uh, one is we're changing it and being more linea lenient and here we're going after cigarette smokers. And uh, so that, that's, uh, it's a hip, uh, you know, it, it's, we, ha we have to be uh, fair to both. Okay, menthol cigarettes, we're talking about uh, Cools and Salem? Yes. Right. And that's been sold for years right next to, uh, re you know, regular uh, cigarettes. So I, I don't know why they pulled that out of the hat, but uh, anyway. Uh, uh, would you like um, an explanation about the differences between tobacco and cannabis ordinance or? Well, just regarding the tobacco and the cannabis, I think the differences with tobacco and, co and, and cannabis are that tobacco used to be able to be purchased by those 18 and over. And so the recent change in state law making it 21 created a different kind of cultural and pur purchasing environment. Um, whereas cannabis, as soon as it became legal, it was also always for over 21. I wholeheartedly agree with you about any kind of um, you know flavors and things like that. Um, but we do have to address things a single ordinance at a time. And I know this is mind numbing for members of the public, but uh, these different rules belong in different uh, silos, unfortunately, but we can certainly work across those silos to make sure that uh, what we do to protect youth in one area can be done to protect youth in another area. Right. Yeah, and regarding menthol, um, it's a best practice across the state because of the youth who do smoke cigarettes, actual uh, smoking cigarettes, the majority of them purchase and use menthol cigarettes. Okay. Uh, and are, are the same, are, are, are you going to speak out when it comes uh, on the agenda today with uh, cannabis and the uh, restrictions? I wasn't planning on it. I know. Okay. I'm not, I'm not asking you that you have to or whatever. But we're, we're looking at very similar things here. And again, we're getting more lenient with one and more restrictive with the other. Uh, I will, I'll go along with this, but I, I would have an exception with menthol cigarettes. Uh, only uh, uh, I don't see the allure that's with the, you know, uh, different flavors like that I've seen with, uh, you know, the others. And, and again, uh, I think what bothered me a lot uh, was when we were uh, talking about cannabis about six months ago. And uh, on our screen there, we had uh, pictures of brownies. We had pictures of gummy bears. We had pictures of, you name it, uh, different uh, marijuana cannabis products. And those are things that uh, I'm totally against as far as, uh, you know, being pushed and out there in the public. And if you leave that on your kitchen table and your kids get a hold of that, you have to go to the hospital and you could actually uh, 
end up uh, being charged with the crime. I know with uh, cigarettes, uh, the cumulative uh, damage is very, very significant. But if a kid actually got a hold of one cigarette, started chewing on it or whatever, uh, they're not going to end up in the hospital. So uh, I, I just I want to I want to make sure we're consistent here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, um, Chair. Yes. Let, I, let me just say that if the if the supervisor wants to bring an ordinance to limit the number of tobacco selling outlets to 13 in the unincorporated county, we could talk about similarities. If we if we want to talk about having distances between each tobacco selling um, uh, uh, outlet, like we do for dispensaries, that would be something you could bring to it. There, we have a tremendous amount of restrictions on cannabis retail operations that we do not have for tobacco. Tobacco is clearly has a long history of, of targeting their product towards children, and uh, we should be doing everything we can to prevent that. Um, and if we want to talk about this, we, we are not relaxing the restrictions in the same way we have for tobacco. You can buy tobacco in every grocery store. Uh, you can get it uh, at vape shops. It's, it's, it's far too prevalent um, and has uh, clear uh, danger written on the side of each and every one of the packets. All right, let's hear from the members of the public. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us about this item? Hello, my name is Tina Cho. I'm from Boulder Creek. Um, I support the ban on flavored tobacco. I have a young child and I do not want her to grow up to be addicted to any sort of nicotine. Um, on a different note, um, it's very difficult for us to hear back here. Um, there's a party going out on in the hallway, and in future reference, I'd appreciate if staff could coordinate those things to not happen simultaneously. Um, anyway, so if anybody else speaks for them to please speak up, because we have a hard time hearing you back here. Sure. Thank you for letting us know. Anyone else? <coughs> Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I have a question. Um, I know of a person that actually got started on tobacco because they were in the fire service and they started chewing because that's what firemen do. And they quickly realized that it was hard on their health and uh, they actually used the um, e-cigarettes to get themselves weaned off nicotine and I was told by this person that you can purchase varying levels of nicotine cartridges is that true can you actually use that to decrease the amount of nicotine consciously while giving yourself the physical um, distraction that a lot of uh, smokers or chewers or whatever they do um, need and as they wean themselves off that and and I'm not sure if that's true so I'm asking Asking for some clarification, are there varying levels of nicotine in these um, e-cigarettes? E Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to us? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the board. Do you want to briefly address that qu question if you know the answer? Sure. There are products with varying levels of nicotine. Part of the ordinance also defines what a uh, nicotine delivery or tobacco delivery device is because the other thing that people do is um, they put other things besides what's meant to be in there, um, other kinds of drugs, hashish, a different kind, you know, um, illicit drugs. And so the user can put whatever they want into the device, and there are different kinds of products available. I will say as a tobacco cessation aid, you could get a flavorless product. You could use uh, nicotine gum. You could access a patch from your physician. There, there are um, other ways to, um, to pursue quitting tobacco rather than flavored nicotine delivery. Thank you. At this point, I'd entertain a motion. Uh, I, uh, um, Chair, I would make the motion to uh, move the recommended actions. Uh, I would also add that I appreciate the work of our community partners, our county staff, um, and uh, our educators who care about the health of young people and have worked very hard to, uh, to address the, the, the new and different ways in which tobacco companies are trying to attract uh, younger users uh, uh, to their product. We're doing a, a great service to the community by preventing that in the future. Okay, so we have a motion. 
second by McPherson. Um, I also want to add my thanks to Mayor Martine Watkins and the city of Santa Cruz, who really brought this issue forward and uh, got the city to, to take the first step, and, and I'm glad we're able to follow suit. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much for your work on this. Uh, we now have a uh, scheduled item, uh, 1045 scheduled item, uh, and I'm going to ask maybe if someone can go grab the folks uh, from no, the hallway. Brenda, Brenda just went out to get Okay, them. perfect. So we'll just give people a moment to come in. Uh, at 10:45, we're not going to do the, uh, the medical, uh, uh, the emergency. That's what we're doing right now. We're going to do that now. Yes, we're, we're just skipping. waiting yeah. for the Good. honorees to come in. Okay. It's, uh, we're excited uh, for our uh, 1045 scheduled item, which is item number 13. It's a presentation recognizing emergency, emergency, emergency medical services week as outlined in a memorandum. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, ask Director Mimi Hall uh, and HSA EMS Emergency Administrator Brenda Brenner to come forward, please, and tell us about uh, this special uh, special day. Good morning, again. Uh, it's my deepest honor to be here today before you to celebrate this year's emergency medical services personnel in Santa Cruz County. EMS Week is a nationally recognized opportunity for us to express our deepest thanks to the round the clock heroism of our EMS providers and also our citizen bystanders who step in to save the lives of those in need. So to be brief, I'd like to just introduce Brenda Brenner, our EMS Administrator for Santa Cruz County, and she's going to lead our presentation. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thanks again for having us here. This is the 13th year that we've um, recognized the uh, first responders for EMS week. Um, EMS in Santa Cruz County consists of a team of responders who work collaboratively to save lives. They include American Medical Response, or AMR, all of the various fire agencies, the law enforcement team, our state parks team, Santa Cruz Regional 911 Dispatchers, that's the 911 Dispatchers, uh, Dominican Hospital Emergency Department, Watsonville Hospital Emergency Department, oh, I'm glad he came, Life Flight, uh, the helicopter service out of Stanford, and CalSTAR, our helicopter service um, from South County and other parts of the state. These responders risk their lives every day to come to our side when we have a moment of need. It takes every member of that team to make this work. Without one member of the team, people would not do as well as they're doing currently in Santa Cruz County. This year we're honoring responses to three emergency calls that took place in the past year. Uh, and Supervisor Coonerty, um, if you could get us started, please um, present our first call, which is a motorcycle accident. Sure. Yeah, so this is our first call, and as Brenda says, it, uh, it demonstrates the importance of a team and collaboration uh, in order to save a life. So on June 11, 2018, it was a perfect day for a motorcycle ride. Marty Herman chose a time of day when traffic was light on Highway 1 in Santa Cruz. Just blocks from home, he was struck by a motorist 
which caused both of his legs to be caught between the motorcycle and the car. His left leg was broken in multiple places due to rolling uh, across the roadway. His right leg was nearly severed and began to bleed uncontrollably. Marty had, taken, uh, had previously taken safety and first aid training in his supervisor's job as a heavy equipment operator for Granite Rock and told bystanders to make a tourniquet out of a t-shirt and wrap it around his right thigh to stop the bleeding. Santa Cruz Fire Department and uh, AMR quickly responded and placed a, a tactical military grade tourniquet uh, to stop the bleeding. And Marty was taken by helicopter to, to, to the helicopter landing zone for immediate transport to the trauma center. Stanford's Life Flight Air Ambulance had begun carrying blood on board the helicopter only two months before. Blood that Marty needed badly due to the amount that he had already lost. Once on board, life flight nurses transfused Marty with two units of blood. He received two more units once he arrived at Stanford Emergency Department. Because of the severity of the damage, Marty's right leg could not be saved. Despite the loss of his leg, Marty is grateful for the help of the bystanders, AMR, the fire department, and life flight for saving his life. This call demonstrates the importance of bystanders bravely helping each other in a time of medical crisis. It also highlights the value of stopping bleeding as quickly as possible. Learning to control bleeding is simple and can be learned by taking a first aid classes such as Stop the Bleed, which can be found on the internet. This also reinforces the importance of helicopter transport being available in our community, making it possible to get trauma victims to trauma centers as quickly as possible so that lives can be saved. Life Flight's decision to begin carrying blood products on their helicopter adds to the life-saving life -saving capability of these valuable medical transport resources. And I'd like uh, Marty Her Herman and his family to come forward. And I'd also ask the following first responders to come forward. From the Santa Cruz Fire Department, John Forbes, Jesse Hardy, and Josh Birnbaum. From AMR, Sammy Abed and Zachary Black. From Stanford Life Flight, uh, even Tulajian and Randy Huff and Emily Otto. And uh, so from, Santa, from the Santa Cruz fire, John, Jesse, and Josh applied a tourniquet and then worked together to carefully place Marty on a spine board. From AMR, Sammy and, Zach, and Zachary assisted by applying a cervical collar and provided other advanced patient care while Zachary drove the ambulance to the landing zone at Dominican Hospital where they met the crew from the life flight helicopter. And from Stanford's life flight, Evan flew the helicopter while Randy and Emily took care of Marty during the flight, inf uh, including infusing blood to replace some of what uh, Marty had lost. I'm going to come forward and present some rec uh, proclamations, uh, but please everyone give these uh, brave responders a round of applause. say thank you so much to all of the people that came to my rescue. Uh, without citizens uh, on the street, I mean, I wouldn't be here. These guys took over, but there were people that I couldn't get in touch with. That, uh, and it's a simple procedure to stop blood. Uh, most people freak out from that, which uh, I'm glad they didn't. I could actually hear them. I could see them because I was face down. But uh, that definitely made a big difference. And these guys put their life on the line every day for us. There's no, uh, there's no reward for that. You guys are over the top. My hat's off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Supervisor Friend and Supervisor Caput, could you please present our second call about saving the life of a four-year-old child? Thank you, Brenda. This one hits particularly close to home because it includes a member of our county family here, but on Christmas Day on 2018, the Page family, which includes Siobhan, Jeremy, and four-year-old Miles, were coming home from a walk on West Cliff Drive, and suddenly, un unexpectedly, Miles began screaming from the back of the car. Siobhan and Jeremy pulled over and tried to determine what was wrong and also tried to calm Miles down, but he was inconsolable. Looking around for help, the parents noticed an urgent care office close by and went there for help, where staff immediately knew that Miles was in trouble and called 911. AMR and Central Fire responders arrived quickly on scene, and although Miles had stopped screaming, the AMR paramedic assessed Miles and recognized the signs of a serious neurological problem and decided to have Miles flown directly by helicopter to Stanford. Less than an hour after the helicopter landed at Stanford, Miles had emergency brain surgery. Doctors and medical personnel credit the decision by the paramedics to get Miles to Stanford by helicopter as saving his life because Miles had experienced a ruptured blood vessel in his brain. Miles would spend five weeks in the pediatric ICU but eventually regained all of his previous physical and mental function. Miles' parents want to recognize the first responders, such as paramedics and EMTs who are often away from their families on holidays. And this call demonstrates the importance of training and experience of AMR paramedics who immediately made the right decision for Miles. It also highlights the importance of rapid helicopter transport being available when needed, and we're fortunate to have two excellent helicopter companies providing service here in the county, Life Flight, responding to the previous incident and CalSTAR responding to this call. Supervisor Caput. Wow, this, uh, this is a frightening story. <laughs> wow. Uh, would the family of Miles Page uh, please come forward? And just, uh, How's he doing? How's Miles doing, by the way? He's doing very well. Thank you, Supervisor. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> would the following responders please come forward from AMR, Stephanie Woke, paramedic, Brandon Laguna, EMT. From Central Fire Protection District, Captain Chad Aiken, <clears throat> Firefighter Nathan Mitchell, Firefighter Forrest uh, Glitzman. Okay. From Cal uh, CalSTAR Helicopter Service, Joshua Clifford, who's the pilot, John Velasquez, uh, Flight Nurse, and Sarah Lindahl, Flight Paramedic. From AMR, Stephanie was the paramedic and lead responder helping Miles and his family on the scene with good care and advice. Brandon assisted Stephanie and drove the ambulance to the helipad at Dominican Hospital. From Central Fire, Captain Aitken, uh, Nathan and Forrest assisted with patient care and the needs of the family and on the, the scene. From CalSTAR, Joshua flew the helicopter, helicopter while John and Sarah cared for Miles while the flight was taking place to Stanford. Wow, what a story. Okay. So please give uh, these first responders a round of applause. And uh, Supervisor Friend's gonna hand out some uh, proclamations, but uh, we're gonna invite, if anyone would like to speak, uh, please feel free to do so. I'm Miles' father, Jeremy, and the day of his stroke, um, we really had no idea what was happening, and he has no history of neurological problems. Um, he has a heart condition that he was born with, but we were really unprepared for 
what happened on Christmas Day. Um, and as we were coming back from a walk, um, we hadn't even uh, gotten back to the house to open presents that morning, and we just thought we would see Siobhan's mother and then head back to the house and have our Christmas morning. And you know, he immediately told us something was wrong, but we didn't know what it was and headed over to urgent care. And um, at that point, um, EMS showed up, and if it hadn't been for their decision to you know, cut through the red tape and go directly to the helicopter and get us to Stanford. Um, neurosurgery up at Stanford said that his chances of surviving if we hadn't gotten up there as quickly as we did would have been next to zero. So um, that was really a decision that saved his life and so much was going through our heads at that point. And I, I couldn't even think of all of the options available to us. So. Um, they had calm heads and immediately recognized what needed to be done and, and saved his life. So thank you to everybody that was involved in that and um, we're eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank you. like Please. to say two things. Yeah, yeah. Please. I'm glad I came into work that it today or that day on Christmas. This is why we work holidays, right? And I'd like to give recognition to that paramedic. This wasn't a usual case to call out a helicopter for. So big recognition to that paramedic. Safe to sleep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Friend and Supervisor Caput. Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Leopold, will you please present our third and last incident, a swift water rescue of two kayakers on the San Lorenzo River. And before you get started, um, one, of the, uh, one of the kayakers um, had a trip to Ireland and really, really wanted to be here. And so I believe that we... Uh, He's calling... No. He's calling in right now. He's going to try and watch the video. <laughs> and He's going to listen. He won't be able to watch because he's okay. calling in FaceTime audio. Got it. So he'll, he'll listen to the presentation as well. He's in. Okay. Hi, Mikey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, wherever you may be. Yes, it's <laughs> nice to... On February 9th, 2019, uh, was one of the most, of the many days where storms threatened Santa Cruz County. The San Lorenzo Valley, uh, the San Lorenzo River was swollen and fast flowing. The conditions were tempting for experienced kayakers. Michael Price and Eric Beeler carefully studied the San Lorenzo River and packed their safety gear, including helmets, life vests and plastic pouches for their phones. Michael had just completed the CPR refresher training five days earlier and Eric was an experienced mountain climber. Once in the water, they paddled and portraged their kayaks around the section of the water where the conditions were too dangerous. Despite their caution, cautious paddling, about six miles downriver, they ran into a pile of wood debris. Both men were tossed from their kayaks into the water. Eric immediately became trapped under the water in a hollow log. Eric recalled thinking, quote, I guess this is what it's like to die. Mike searched for Eric as he stood in waist deep water near where he thought Eric might have gone under. He began feeling around with his foot and felt something soft. It was Eric. He went under the water and worked to free Eric and bring him to the shore. By the time he pulled out Eric, Mike estimates, estimates about three minutes had passed. Once on shore, Eric was unconscious, had no pulse, and, was, and wasn't breathing. Mike began CPR. After two and a half rounds of CPR and rescue breaths, Mike's, or Eric's pulse came back and he started breathing. Mike secured Eric on the riverfront and moved away to get it to a cell phone to call 911. Mike's phone was broken, but Eric's was still intact. Fog made cell reception difficult. Over the next five and a half hours, with the phone battery going low, the 911 dispatch center was able to ping the phone and come up with an approximate location of the pair. 
The 911 call eventually came back at 5.26 p.m. Dispatcher Mike Krawiak, Crack, oh, let me get that right. Crack Oviak, assisted by dispatcher Arnie Castro, sent Santa Cruz Fire and AMR to try to find the pair and help them. The incident commander, Battalion Chief Danny Klein, requested help from Ben Lohman's Swiftwater Rescue Team and Felton Fire. Cal State Park sent their Swiftwater Rescue Team. And we also responded were Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department and Amer American Medical Responses Medic 6 and AMR Supervisor. It was extremely difficult to locate and reach the pair who was stuck in an area next to a 10-foot sheer cliff. One rescue team started from the top, one from the middle, and the third team started from the bottom of where the responders believed the pair to be. The rescue teams had to cross the San Lorenzo River three times using ropes to traverse across. Once they reached the kayakers, responders manually extricated them safely, transporting them over <coughs> the flowing river waters. Despite overwhelming odds, both Eric and Mike survived, as did all of the rescuers. A number of factors played into the su successful rescue. The two kayakers were very well prepared and trained, including having CPR training. One of the phones still worked, and Mikey was able to get one bar of the coverage. The 911 dispatcher located the phone using GPS technology and was able to send the right responders. The rescuers worked tightly as a team, risking their own lives to save the two men. AMR was able to provide advanced life support care to Eric, whose heart had stopped and was suffering from hypothermia due to being exposed to the cold water and elements for five and a half hours. Both men have made full recovery and continue their friendship today. This situation demonstra demonstrates the importance of being prepared in all you do and the critical importance of learning and performing CPR. Without the actions of his friend, Mike, Eric would not be alive today. It also demonstrates the importance of a, the multi-agency collaboration and teamwork to train and respond, doing what is needed to search, rescue, and transport people in need. To everyone who responded to this call, we extend our thanks and recognitions for your willingness to respond immediately to a dangerous situation and help people in need. Would Mike Price, who oh, might be on the phone, and Eric Peeler and their families please come forward? And would the following EMS responders please come forward? And I beg your patience, it's a long list of people. From American Medical Response, Greg Benson, Trevor O'Donohue, and Eric Gonzalez. From Santa Cruz Regional 911, there's Mike Krakovic uh, and Annie Castro. From Santa Cruz Fire Department, there's Battalion Chief Dan Klein, Captain Jason Hogan, Captain Johnny Fox, Captain Josh Beerbaum, Engineer Jesse Hardy, Firefighter Trevor Martin, Firefighter Ryan Van Kathoven, Firefighter Greg Gardner, Firefighter Kevin Klein, Firefighter Thomas Bischoff. From the Ben Lohman Swiftwater Rescue Team, there's Captain Rick Alves, uh, Matt Boynton, Nick Burgess, Xavier Chavez, Tom Newt. From California State Parks, there's Peace Officer, Super, Peace Officer Supervisor Scott Sipes, Peace Officer Alex Tabone. From California Fish and Wildlife, there's the Warden Dan McCall. And from the Felton Fire Department, there is Incident Safety Officer and Division Chief Robert Gray, Captain Daniel Davis, Firefighter Nicole Scarpace, Driver Operator Renee Fenker, Driver Operator Nathan Fenker, Firefighter Tyler Magnin, uh, Firefighter Nina Lavelle, and probationary firefighter Dustin Ells. Will you please join me in, in thanking this great group of, uh, of rescuers? Let me, a couple more comments, is that right? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, 
Mike Price is Eric's friend who went kayaking that day with Eric. He risked his own life to search for someone for and rescue Eric and started the CPR when it was needed. He was able to risk secure a spot for Eric and sit by and sit by using his feet to hollow out the mud bank beneath the cliffs. Then he took Eric's phone and found a spot with one bar of signal strength to call 911. Once responders arrived, Mike assisted responders in helping move Eric to a location where he could be taken to the hospital. From AMR, Greg is a paramedic supervisor and he was dispatched to the scene where he led the medical response to the call. Trevor and Eric are paramedics who responded with advanced life support ambulance to the scene and treated and transported Eric to Dominican Hospital. <laughs> From Santa Cruz Regional 911, Arnie is a public safety dispatcher three and Mike, now retired, was a public safety dispatcher three. Both Annie and Mike used their extensive training and experience to help locate and facilitate coordination for search, rescue, and care for the patient. From Santa Cruz Fire, the incident commander who led the entire response, Jason, Johnny, Josh, Jesse, Trevor, Ryan, Greg, Kevin, and Thomas collaborated in the search and rescue. From Ben Loman's Swift Water Rescue Team, Rick, Matt, Nick, Xavier, and Tom worked to coordinate and manage the elements of ropes and field equipment to set up and perform a safe and swift water rescue operation. From California State Parks, Scott and Alex also worked to coordinate and manage the elements of ropes and field equipment to set up and perform a safe and swift water rescue operation. From California Fish and Wildlife, Dan assisted in locating the kayakers to perform the rescue. From Felton Fire, Division Chief Robert Gray was the incident safety officer. Daniel, Nicole, Renee, Nathan, Tyler, Nina, and Dustin collaborated in the search and rescue. Ladies and gentlemen, you talk about a team effort. This is as good as it gets. This is as good as it gets. And I'll come down to present some proclamations. <laughs> I think while Supervisor McPherson hands out uh, the proclamations, if uh, you want to share any words about that day, that would be uh, great. Uh, you'd think it in more than three and a half months, I'd figured out how to um, talk about this without crying. <laughs> and I might have figured out what I was going to say, but I haven't worked out how to say thank you to the person and the people that gave me back everything. Um, I'm still a father, a brother, a son. Uh, seeing how much effort was put in, I, I can't figure out any way I could possibly thank you. Seeing how much impact this has had on the lives of my family and friends, and I didn't pass away, I can't imagine how it would have felt to them had I not been here any longer. Um, I listened to every minute of the tapes. Um, so I know somewhat what an incredible effort was put in. Um, and I can't convey how appreciative I am that we have this, these type of people so that people like myself can be a little crazy and go out and do stupid things, perhaps, <laughs> <laughs> and then come back to talk about it. So as, as little as it is, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now I'm Eric's dad. And you know, what can I say? I have my son back. He's version 2.0 now, <laughs> although sometimes we refer to him as 1.5. <laughs> part of him is still very much alive and, uh, after being completely dead. 
spent 16 days in the hospital after the, the resuscitation and after the rescue fighting to stay alive. I watched it for 16 days. It was pretty amazing. There are some pretty incredible people in this room. There's a thread, I think, that ties everybody together. And so I just want to read, if I can find it, a quote from Albert Camus that, for me, sums up a lot, especially for the honorees, the other two honorees, the family, and especially for my son. You probably heard this a few times, but it's real. In the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. And that makes me happy. <clears throat> For it says that no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me there's something stronger, something better, pushing right back. That's all of me. And that's a special gift. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody. With the rest of those. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for giving me back my son. Oh, you're welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, why don't we offer a round of applause to all of our uh, honorees today and the families. saw the movie Breakthrough, uh, Mikey, did you want to there's say a anything? slight, there's a similarity. This is Mikey. Oh, we got it. This is Mikey. Hey, I'm going to can um, everyone hear me? Yes, yes. we got you, oh, Mike. Okay. All right, well, uh, hey, um, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just an overwhelming and, and uh, like, a res resounding gratitude. Um, yeah, uh, um, my uh, wife and I, like, um, live in Ben Lomond, um, just over on Keene Road, and, and so to meet our neighbors, um, <laughs> our <laughs> who are volunteers and like and who um, risked like their their own lives to um, <laughs> to rescue us, um, and it's just and um, just it's an incredible lifelong um, impact of gratitude, um, and 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 to 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 just know that that. My wife uh, Jane, um, she was with um, in, in incident command, and and um, she was be being <laughs> um, taken care of and, and and assured over there, and just the overwhelming response from just so many <laughs> people. Um, yeah, I, I know as like a volunteer first responder, and uh, um, he, 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 there's just training after training after training uh, to get you prepared for a day that you hope that you'll never um, have to put the skills to use. Um, I know that's like similar with myself, and you know, I've taken CPR classes for years, and like <laughs> I never want to have to put them to use. And um, so, so yeah, so just uh, I'm. Uh, grateful that, that that I still have a friend uh, here. I'm, I'm grateful that um, even though we were only a few mile, miles away from, from my house, uh, we, we were in the middle of nowhere, and even <laughs> from from there, we were we were able to <laughs> to get help. Um, yeah, so we are like for forever like indebted to all the Santa Cruz County response. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Mikey, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. It's Frank. 
I still, I still love you. <laughs> I love you too, Frank. You're my hero. <laughs> I don't know. You're surrounded by like a lot of a lot of heroes in that room right now. That's so right. There are you can a lot take of... your pick. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. Take care. Of Looking course. forward to the next time we get to see you. Yeah, definitely. All right, guys. Thanks for for for, for, for um, uh, thanks for letting me call in. But all right, all right. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go. This Bye. would not have been complete without your calling in. Say hi to James. Yeah, I will. I will. Bye. All right, Frank. Bye, guys. Ooh. So, thank you very much, uh, Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Leopold for this long read. I appreciate that. Um, all of the responders in our EMS system work together every day to assure the best possible care is provided to our patients here in the county, and that can make the difference between life and death. Equal, equally as important is the care that's provided by the bystanders before the emergency responders arrive on the scene. Stopping the severe bleeding, starting CPR, calling 911, performing amazing rescues. These are some of the key actions that anyone can take and they too can make the difference between life and death. The Emergency Medical Care Commission and County EMS, excuse me, Emergency Medical Services Program would like to thank you all for your participation in EMS Week in recognizing the dedication and effort of these people and their peers in the EMS community. We've prepared a uh, small reception in the hallway and invite everybody to join us. And this concludes EMS Week Celebration 2019. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, and Thank you to Brenda and Jillian and all the people who pulled this together. Uh, there is a reception out in the hallway and I think the board would like to join you. Uh, so we are going to recess until uh, 1140, or sorry, yes, 1140. Uh, so we can join you out in the hallway and then uh, when we'll see you out there. Thank you very much.
We're now uh, coming back for item number nine, which is to consider an ordinance amending chapter 7.130 of the Santa Cruz County Code relating to cannabis dispensary siting criteria and schedule the ordinance for a second reading and final adoption on June 11th as outlined in a memorandum by the CAO. And we have our cannabis licensing officer here to give us a quick overview. Good morning, board. Um, the proposed siting criteria changes are meant to align the cannabis code to current planning department policies of utilizing zone district boundaries and not parcel lines for establishing buffers. Zone districts mainly follow parcel lines, the difference being split zone parcels. The proposed change will add a total of nine parcels to be available in the county for retail operations. The change is so limited because the Safeway parcel is split zoned residential and there are no other split zone parcels within the county which would lead to additional parcels being available for cannabis retail operations. Additionally, we're proposing a general exception to siting criteria for our compassionate care operators, WAM and Santa Cruz Vets Alliance. This general exception can only be made when a finding that the general public benefit outweighs other land use and public health and safety concerns. Additionally, the general exception will not result in our compassionate care facilities relocating to zone districts not included within the current code. Any questions? Are there any questions? Yeah, can you go back just, uh, that went so fast on the screen here. Okay, commercials, uh, tourists. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Supervisor Friend? I, I just, one brief question. I didn't see a map, but I did see the, the, that there was a, um, oh, there we go. So it's exclusively on the section of 41st and there's no possibility for any other location? Um, so for the, we have two, um, two criteria, or two changes. Um, the first is the siting criteria change. This would allow any of the operators to move to one of these nine parcels in on 41st. Right. We worked with the GIS department to assess if um, this change would affect any other areas of the county, and this change is isolated, and it's based um, solely on that split zone Safeway parcel. Okay. Okay. Uh, and real quick, uh, the, <clears throat> the wording, it uh, does not affect 600-foot six, uh, school buffer. Does it uh, allow for uh, staff uh, uh, discretion to change that? No. Okay, so the 600 foot uh, buffer zone near schools is written in stone. The, so the, for this change, it is written in stone, yes. For the whole ordinance we're gonna talk about? Well, for, for the general exception for WAM and SCBA, we'd have to have that public benefit and it would be very difficult to have a finding of public benefit if you're within 600 feet of a school. Okay. Um, it's really about the waiving the buffer for another cannabis dispensary or potentially an alcohol and drug treatment facility. The, um, the general exception uh, that allows these things, these nine parcels, does not um, affect any buffers associated with the school. It only affects the residential zone district buffer. Okay, and, and none of these sites are within 600 feet of a school? No. Okay. Uh, uh, Chair, let me just say that uh, I'm obviously very familiar with this site, that the, the Granny Perp location was actually the first um, the dispensary location in the unincorporated area. Um, there were problems with Granny Perp, but none of them had to do with their siting and the, their relationship with neighbors. Uh, in fact, I don't, I don't recall ever getting any complaints from neighbors. They generally worked well with the people uh, that were there. And this minor change, which is, you know, the, uh, the Home Depot is not all of a sudden going to become housing anytime soon. And so the residential uh, zoning didn't seem to make sense. So I support this change. Okay, great. So let's open it up now for members of the public who may want to speak to us on this item. Please come forward. Yeah, hi, I'm a dispensary owner with Santa Cruz Mountain Herb, and I, uh, this would, I think this is a good change to help us be able to find better locations 
than being held hostage by our landlords. And I, I appreciate everything that you guys have done to help this come through. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speakers, seeing none, that closes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for action. I would move approval of the recommended actions. Motion by Leopold. Second. Second by McPherson. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number 10 is to consider the 2019-2020 tax and revenue anticipation notes uh, not to exceed uh, a total of $45 million. Authorize the auditor to secure the note, adopt a resolution authorizing the sale of the 2019-2020 tax, re uh, tax and revenue app anticipation notes, approve the execution of a continuing disclosure certificate, approve the form of the official statement and official notice of sale, approve the distribution of a preliminary official statement, and authorize actions uh, and execution of documents in connection with the issuance of the 2019-2020 trans uh, as outlined in a memorandum of the auditor, controller, tax collector. Thank you, Chair Coonerty. Um, Edith has asked that Christina Mowry, Deputy CAO, address the board on this topic. Thank you. Ms. Good morning, Mowry. Chair Coonerty, members of the board, um, County Budget Manager, Christina Mowry. Um, at the request of the Auditor Controller, as you just learned, I'm presenting this item for you today. She's unable to be here. Um, and before you today is the county's annual tax and revenue anticipation note, commonly called the TRAN, in an amount not to exceed a total of $45 million. With your approval to proceed today, the notes are scheduled to be sold on June 12, 2019, and will mature within a year. These short-term notes are issued to address timing differences or lag time between cash disbursements, which occur evenly throughout the year, and revenue receipts such as property taxes and state and federal reimbursements, which are received less regularly and later in the year, thus creating a cash flow problem for the county. This year, we are once again recommending an issuance of $45 million in notes. In recent years, the county has issued up to $50 million in notes. The county's cash position has improved in part due to the county's increased cash reserves, resulting in less borrowing being needed. Fiscal and economic presentations will be made later this week to both Moody's and Standard & Poor's rating agencies by the county's financing team, which includes staff from the Auditor Controller's Office, the County Administrative Office, County Council, and the county's external financial advisor. The rating agencies should be issuing our ratings shortly, and we anticipate that they will be the highest short-term rating available as we have received in the last two years. Working with our financial advisor and bond counsel, the county has pre prepared the preliminary official statement and other required documents necessary for the sale. These documents are included in today's board item for your approval. The interest rate will be fixed upon the sale and payable at maturity. So I ask that your board approve the recommended actions, authorizing the auditor controller to proceed with the issuance of the 2019-20 TRAN in an amount not to exceed a total of $45 million, and that the board adopt the attached resolution authorizing the sale of the notes and approving the execution of a continuing disclosure certificate, approving the form of the official statement and official notice of sale, and approve the distribution of the preliminary official statement and authorize any necessary actions and execution of those documents in connection with the issuance of the TRAN. And I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank the whole county team, the administration, the employees, uh, this board, everybody that's taken the action about um, having us uh, can, uh, maintain our reserve at the 10% level. Uh, we get a better rating. Um, we have less borrowing too, and uh, it's um, it's just really uh, the benefits of that are are multiple. And I just want to thank everybody that's involved for getting us in this better position than we were, say, five years ago. Thank you. And uh, go ahead. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you. Um, 
When you go make the presentation in front of the rating companies, mm -hmm. yes. will you mention the passage of Measure G and the and the community's commitment uh, to helping us uh, pay for uh, critical uh, services? Absolutely. Part of the the disclosure that we provide them variances, so we explain all the different variances. Obviously, our sales tax is up as a result of Measure G, and we'll be highlighting that for them. Yeah, well, uh, I appreciate the work that our board has done to build our reserve, the, the critical work that our staff has done to help us make that happen, and the important support that we receive from the community. Um, this, this is uh, a un, usually unknown p p part of uh, county business, uh, but the savings here are very real, and I appreciate that uh, quite a bit, and I think the taxpayers appreciate that, so thank you. Thank you. So I, want to, I want to thank you also. And, uh, this is standard uh, operation, yes, uh, yes. operational procedure, right? Uh, I mean, if if a board, not us, we're not we're not going to do that. But what if, what if they voted no? They it would it, it would paralyze the whole uh, government, right? Well, we, we need the loan in order to be able to pay our expenses timely because sure. we don't have the receipts that come in the same way that our disbursements go out. Sure. So it would be an important thing for us to, to consider. Thank you. And, and I don't know. We the only other option we would have is to look at using our reserves, to to make the difference up. You bet. And uh, I'll move to approve, uh, well, but we'll wait first, for public comment. First, we'll hear public comment. Then, uh, then I appreciate your motions. So, uh, is there any public comment? Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos. I am familiar with this. I, it took me a while to understand it, <laughs> but I, I do understand it. What my question is, and I wasn't able to go back in previous years' history, uh, but you're talking about the savings. What is, this is $45 million that of debt we're taking on now that's the shortfall. How does that compare to what the county has had to do, say, last year and the year before? And what do you expect the anticipation anticipated uh, terms to be based on history. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. Uh, I mean, you covered this in your presentation, yes. but if you want to restate it, sure. go for it. It's the, uh, the 45 million is consistent with what we've asked for in the last two years. Um, it has dropped from the prior years. Um, and the terms, last year's terms, we had a 1.45% yield. Um, it's running a bit higher than that, and we'll know once we have the uh, competitive bid and the pricing. Um, so it'll come in a little bit higher. Great. So now, Supervisor Caput, you want to make your motion? Move to approve. Yep. Motion by Caput, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you all for your work on that. Uh, item number 11 is to consider a report on the county facility wayfinding and parking congestion, approved plans and specifications for parking lot expansion at the government center, direct the general services department to advertise bids and set the opening, uh, bid opening for 3 p.m. on June 9, 19, 2019 in the general services department and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the director of general services. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, our GSD team on this item. Very quickly, uh, this is really the culmination of some efforts Carol and Michael started about a year ago to really examine our um, wayfinding, and I have been instructed to define what that is. That's how we navigate, help people navigate any kind of um, facility or campus. And that's kind of the technical term. Wayfinding and really our access, public and workforce access in terms of parking and alternative transportations at our three main campuses. Today you're gonna have a progress report on what they've learned so far and some recommended immediate actions around improving parking here at the um, government center. Um, and we'll be uh, talking through about some ways to move forward in the future. I just want to stress and, and appreciate that Carol and Michael b generated both qualitative and, and quantitative um, analysis to support these recommendations and uh, really leverage some um, employee feedback in moving forward. Um, and I'll just support along the way in today's presentation. Great, thank you. Excellent, uh, thank you. Uh, it has been a uh, exciting uh, past year uh, as the GST director, uh, especially dealing with the, the parking and wayfinding uh, challenge that we've had at all three of our campuses. 
Uh, with that said, closer. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, with that said, we decided to take a kind of a step back and we were challenged by uh, the great support of the sales office and in, in kind of in, guard, uh, in partnership with the strategic plan development that's been happening within this county over the last two years. Um, and actually, yeah, about the last two years. Uh, we really tried to look at some solutions that really had county alternative transportation programs at the first and foremost of trying to figure out uh, on how to decrease traffic uh, for um, demand on our parking and congestion, as well as uh, we also tried to do county efforts to assess and improve the customer experience at both the uh, public, uh, for both the public and the county workforce uh, at all three sites. Today we also have an overview of our one of our recommendations today, which is an expansion of uh, parking at this site and some of the uh, great items that kind of went into the recommendation that we have in front of you, as well as some of the creative financing uh, on how it was funded that were identified in the board letter. And everything that we would try to do, we always try to implement the same priority, which is low cost, lo uh, low cost and no cost improvements. Now for collaboration on this, there's a lot of work that has gone in this. We've worked with uh, uh, Parks Department, because uh, they utilize the space currently uh, for different events. Uh, we've worked with uh, DPW, uh, we've worked with Environmental Health, HSA, HSD, County Council, County Clerks, Auto Controller, District Attorney, ISD, Probation, District Attorney Investigators, sorry I had to underline because they carry guns, I got to say that. <coughs> uh, the District Attorneys themselves that are here on late nights and doing uh, cases, uh, Ag Extension, uh, CAO's Office, uh, some Board of Supervisors staff, um, GSD, SEIU, um, and also the public uh, is one of the most important things uh, about this, that the solutions that we've come up kind of incorporate all the different departments as well as the uh, public that we, we hear from on a daily basis. So with that said, uh, we're gonna jump right into the wayfinding. The first slide here kind of identifies an example of the first thing we identified going to each campus or center. The slide on the left identifies the Emmeline campus. With the Emmeline campus, we identified there was only one main directory. Um, initial review identified that the current directory had a lot of what was identified as environmental growth covering the sign, which kind of made it unreadable. Um, which was an issue. Another issue with the sign is it identified by letters and not necessarily by address, uh, which also causes some confusion for those that visit the, the site of Emmeline. For the government center, we had one main directory, which is as soon as you walk through the government center, uh, if you come through this entrance, uh, it's on the left-hand side. If you're not paying attention and you miss it, then you're, you're kind of lost and out of hope. Uh, at the rec uh, so the sign there is an example of what that sign is. Uh, for the Freedom Campus, they don't have a centralized directory, uh, what, but they did have one directory that we were able to identify, and it is currently missing uh, some of the programs on that campus, uh, and it's not necessarily centrally located that helps people get around the campus. <clears throat> the next one is uh, to show some of the improvements that we have already initiate, uh, initiated or will be initi in initiated. For example, on the Emmeline campus and working with HSD and uh, HSA and the other occupants of the campus, um, sorry, I'm being asked why it's spinning on the right hand side. Uh, we develop a new sign, a new uh, system which eliminates the lettering, uh, goes with an address system which is at the recommendation of the employees of the campus to make it a little bit more simple, uh, as well as we expanded the directories to six locations in total. Uh, so it'll be a little bit easier to uh, find your way around the campus. Uh, for the government center, we did install a couple of new directories in the elevators uh, that, uh, I, uh, be very honest, we've received a lot of different compliments uh, since they've gone up, as well as we've had some learning experiences about putting them up, which is a great, uh, great thing. For the Freedom Campus, you'll see that we have a, uh, it's still trying to load, and the reason it's trying to load is, uh, uh, we have a new building going in place that hopefully will be open July 1, uh, 2019. 
uh, we would like to sit down and meet with all the occupants of the campus and kind of go through uh, the same thing that we do with the Amline campus, what the directory would look like, what would be the best way uh, for the signage and everybody on the, uh, at, on the campus. So that's uh, a work in progress, if you would say. Okay. Okay. Um, with that said, some other improvements that we've been, sorry, I missed, I missed something. Sorry, first time in front of the board doing it as director, so learning. Um, with that, we also have uh, ISD has been working on some novel ideas and solutions. They are identified in the board letter, and I just want to uh, commend them for uh, really helping us out along the way. Uh, for example, the uh, directors that we did put in the government center, uh, that was a big help from uh, ISD. Um, and now every time we need to update or replace it, we've developed a no-cost, low-cost solution. Uh, which is basically uh, controlled by ISD. We can just basically print uh, a new sheet and update, which I thought was uh, outstanding. And so thank you, ISD. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce, uh, or I'd like to pass it over to our assistant director, Carol Johnson, to talk about some of the other alternative transportation ideas. Thank you. Have. Good morning, board. Pleasure to be in front of you this morning, or this afternoon. As Michael stated earlier, our first goal and uh, primary, primary purpose for general services and our alternative transportation program is to, of course, reduce the demand for parking, not only at 701, but at Emmeline and the Freedom Campus as well. Some of the things that we've done over the years, we are members of Ecology Action. With that, that provides us access or our employees access to interest-free bike loans, emergency ride home vouchers, bus passes for employees who work at the 701 Government Center. We're also looking at initiating a, uh, similar to the jump bikes that you see out front, perhaps something, a platform similar to that at other campuses. Employees can then utilize that instead of getting into a car, or taking a bike between here and say Emmeline. We're also working to encourage uh, carpools and ride sharing. We look to work with ISD to develop an app similar to Lyft or Uber. Uh, employees can access to coordinate rides going from South County up to North County. Um, Ecology Action currently incentivizes their employees to take uh, non-motorized transportation, so we'll be looking at that as well. Increasing parking availability for energy efficient vehicles. We're also going to be reevaluating the bus pass program. As I stated earlier, that's currently just available for employees at 701. Be, but what can we do to spread that to other locations throughout the county? Not only the major campuses, but perhaps Ag Commission, 640 Capitola Road. Um, we're also going to be reaching out to other local employers, looking at their programs, seeing if there are ways that we can share those programs with them. And of course, we will be uh, conducting a lot of outreach to the county employees to find out what they're looking for as far as alternative transportation um, and solutions to our parking program. <coughs> we're also, um, the facilities master plan includes an opportunity for WeWork sites that could reduce um, trans congestion coming north or southbound and provide employ employees an opportunity to actually work closer to home. Um, what you see in front of you now is an example of the parking conditions currently at, M at the Emmeline campus. They are, um, the parking there is not prioritized for clients. There's been significant asphalt deterioration over the years. And as Michael said earlier, the campus wayfinding is, is lacking. There's also a parking shortage that's been identified between 1080 Emmeline and the 1400 building. And there have been times over the last couple of years where county and employee vehicles have been vandalized. Um, the middle is, uh, there's no picture, but what we're looking, but we've identified issues here that includes insufficient parking, and we've estimated that that is approximately 207 spaces, and that the markings here at the, um, in the parking lot are faded, no longer identify employee, visitor, no employee numbers, and at the Freedom Campus, once the new Health Services Agency building opens, that the part there will be a parking shortage beginning July 1st, and that currently, as well there, the parking is not prioritized for clients. So that's what was, and the next slide identifies some of the things that um, we see on the horizon, as well as what we've currently done. 
The first picture, again, is at the Emmeline campus and identifies um, parking in front of the 1030 Emmeline Child Care Center building, where we've improved the paving, uh, eliminated the, the tripping hazards, and added striping. And at the government center lot, the item that's on your board agenda today for review, but in addition to that item, we're also looking to restripe um, the main parking lot. And then at the Freedom Campus, we're looking for low, no cost or low cost interim improvements to the parking down there once the new building opens. And I'd just like to add that as these improvements are investigated, we will definitely be looking to work with all of the employees as well as the departments and the users of those campuses and reach out to them and get their feedback before we make any decisions and so that we can incorporate their ideas and solutions into um, those programs. This slide here is basically a snapshot of the current condition of parking demand at 701. We did a survey back in April. It determined that between the county and court, we have a total of 890 employees working here and that we have effective employee parking spaces of 456. This includes 701, the main jail, the street parking between Dakota, May Avenue, and on Ocean Street, and that there's a current shortage of 207 spaces. I want to highlight that um, beginning June 1st, we currently have an agreement with the Resource Center for Nonviolence, and that parking, which totals 15 spaces, is going away. And over the last couple of years, employees used to be able to park in the neighborhood behind Jack in the Box, and that is no longer allowed. I think the county is, gets eight spaces on a first come, first serve basis for that area. Part of the um, survey that we did, we reached out to employees to find out how they get to work, and if it's not using an alternative transportation method, what's the barrier? So 72.2% drive alone four to five days a week, and most of those individuals identified that due to after work commitments or whatever, they um, are unable to either take the bus or to carpool or take a van. That um, some employees, 9.3%, do come to work either walking or biking, and those that don't identified that if, if they don't, they don't live within zero to five miles or they actually live outside of the county. 6.4% carpool four to five days a week, and less than 0.5% utilize the bus. We got lots of suggestions when we did the survey, as you can imagine. Um, the ones that I'd like to highlight on here are ones that we're trying to address over the short term and the long term, both through alternative transportation and with the um, parking lot expansion project and that is to eliminate the assigned parking, restripe the 701 parking area, add more parking around the, around the building. Employees complained about those assigned spots that are always empty because employees are out on vacation. Uh, redesign the parking program, add Uber or Lyft to the emergency ride home program, and add more charging stations. What you see in front of you now is um, the plans, the design plans for the new parking lot. It will uh, provide a total of 72 new parking spaces, 95 total including department head row. Um, we are looking to develop a system for higher utilization of the main lot. So those assigned spaces that stay empty, could we make it a pooled lot similar to what is used over at the main jail? We're also going to be analyzing the fleet in the radio shop area. Is that an effective use of that space? There are cars that um, sit there, such as the sheriff's office, waiting for parts. Could they be stored someplace else? And then on an annual basis, General Services does a departmental survey to uh, find out what cars aren't being driven a minimum of 7,000 miles, which is the county threshold for utilization of vehicles. So working with those departments do they really need those vehicles? What's the purpose of those vehicles? Can we eliminate some of them and free up some space out in the main lot? And I'm gonna turn it back over to Michael. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so when we really started this, uh, the project um, uh, for the 
uh, parking construction, we really tried to look at some of the strategic plan elements that were, were coming out. Uh, we really worked with DPW um, regarding the uh, surface water management uh, aspect. Uh, we worked with uh, planning uh, for the environmental review and we'll continue to work with them uh, moving forward. Um, we've also worked with uh, uh, quite a bit of different um, uh, materials and architects trying to come up with a design that ultimately delivers us a product that expands uh, what parks uh, currently utilizes the space for so they will have uh, additional programming capacity. Uh, as well as develop a surface that is permeable, uh, that eliminates the current asphalt next to uh, the 701 Ocean Street building, which I'll go to this next slide real quick. Um, eliminates the asphalt next to the where the current director's row is and replaces it with the permeable geogrid uh, material that you see here in front of you. Now this same material happens to be what UCSC just installed at the new hay barn, uh, or not the new hay barn, but the hay barn. Um, and a picture here is exactly what it kind of looks like. As you'll see that it does have lane markers that can be removable. Um, one beautiful thing about this system is it is not established for a long-term um, use. So for example, in five years, if we wish to repurpose that, that space, we can actually take this whole parking system up and relocate it to somewhere else in the county to, relo to reutilize the materials if we wanted to, I'm not saying we should, but uh, to, for reuse. Uh, the installation is, a, is permeable surface, uh, solar power lighted, uh, extremely strong, up to 100 tons per square meter, extremely durable, um, soil stabilization ground eco-grid system. Um, so through this Ocean Street, we really try to incorporate a lot of the environmental focus in this design, uh, so much so that it actually meets some of the uh, Prop 68 uh, application requirements with parks that we're going to be exploring uh, working with uh, Director Gaffney. Here's just kind of a top of, uh, topographical view of the Ocean Street campus uh, related to the south side of 701 building where you actually identify and get a visual of where the 81 spots would be, as well as an additional 14 spots uh, that are, would be gated or behind a gated area that we are hoping to relocate all the county vehicles that need to be utilized uh, to this space. So that way it'll protect us for vandalism, as well as uh, give us a target to, uh, for our fleet size that we're, we're targeting for. Oh. With that said, I, at the very beginning of the uh, presentation, we identified that this came from, uh, a lot of this started from the public and uh, it did come from the public and employees. Uh, more importantly, the first month or so when I started here, we did a walk with Ann Scott, who happens to be our parking um, <clears throat> attendant. Everybody knows Ann really well. You see her out there in her pink, she in the audience? Oh, she's in the audience, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, did a walkthrough with Ann, and it was just a fountain of knowledge that just came from her regarding the different issues that, have, that happen on the, the campus during different times, whether it's jury, uh, where, where we have people uh, secretly parking, the three o'clock shuffle. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the three o'clock shuffle, but at three o'clock, we have a bunch of staff that go get their cars and then bring them over, right? For safety, absolutely should. Uh, but it's, it's funny that you see everybody go together at one time just to move their cars over here when the lot frees up. Um, but it's things like that that I learned, and they all came from Ann Scott. Uh, so I want to give, a, a, you know, a lot of these ideas that, that have popped up regarding some of these solutions, I mean, they really started from staff, they started from the public, started from the employees, and especially Ann Scott. So I want to say thank you, Ann. All right. Uh, with that, With that, uh, we are basically uh, asking the board to uh, accept and file a progress report related to uh, improving the county wayfinding facilities and parking congestion. Uh, approve the plans and specs uh, on file with the board. I probably don't need to read this, do I? No? no well, okay, good, thank we'll you. We'll read it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, with that said, I'll 
pass it right back over to Let me uh, close this up. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the progress report today. Carol and Michael have quite a bit of work ahead to continue working on these ideas and engaging our employees and members of the public to better understand how we can implement different parking management programs if you do move forward um, and uh, allow us to expand the parking lot here at 701. Um, one of the things that's been very important in this work is trying to balance the immediate needs that we're experiencing with the long-term campus master planning that we see going um, on in the future. So I think the selection of the type of product that Michael and his team is recommending um, aligns with that, that probability that we may be making some large decisions about how to better use this campus in the coming years and we're not um, overextending ourselves and investing in assets today that we may want to reconsider in, in, the, in the very uh, near future. Um, again, this really aligns with our operational excellence goal within the strategic plan, we're looking at customer experience. And when we speak to that, we clearly mean members of the public, but we also mean our workforce. And we want to make it so coming to work every day is easy and they don't start out um, stressed out and trying to find uh, parking. We will continue to look at our alternative transportation models. The best solution here is reducing demand. Um, those are some longer term solutions we need to continue to, to work through. But uh, I think this is a great start for us to start really digging into these issues. And we do have some opportunities should you choose to go forward. Great, thank you. Are there questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, I appreciate the presentation. Uh, I, it's, there's clearly a need uh, for parking. Um, could you just tell me, um, with these additional spaces that would be on the, the side of the building, um, does that create any more public spaces? Yes, yeah, so the actual, uh, so in this design, we took in consideration a lot of different factors. One of them was that we know that on certain days we have shortages like today, uh, looking out my window, we have a shortage today of public parking space. Um, in working with Ann Scott, we identified a few things. We identified that we do have a lot of county vehicles that are currently parking in the uh, public space. So in this proposal, <coughs> in this idea, in, uh, in this solution that we're working on, uh, that is taken in consideration to get those vehicles out of that lot, thus freeing up, uh, at minimum right now, we've identified uh, 18 parking spots that can be freed up for the public at minimum. In addition, we're still working on more, um, and that's at any point in time. So uh, we did take that in consideration. Yeah, well, I think that's important because we hear those concerns. I, I've definitely heard from concerns from um, uh, staff about the need uh, for parking, especially those who work here late at night. I, my concern is a little bit also about process, uh, about um, you know taking space that is in the parks, and and transferring it to a different use. Uh, it seems like we're not taking advantage of the parks commission at least to weigh in as a, as sort of our public representatives. You talked about the the public being interested, um, and uh, I'm I'm interested in possibly having it go to the park commission. They have a meeting at the beginning of June that could come back to our board on June 11th um, uh, with their recommendation. I think it's a good way to uh, engage the community. This, is a, this has been a long-standing need and a few weeks won't uh, make a difference, but we could get a useful input from them that will help us. Uh, any other? I, I just really appreciate the wayfinding at the M line Avenue. Uh, it's really difficult to find out where you should where you can go or where, where, where things are located. Um, and here at the county center, I, I know we're expanding spaces, but I've heard some people say, boy, they're really tight. Now, are they are these new spaces, this new structure, is it gonna be a little wider or is it the same or is it just? Uh, yes, we do plan on addressing two, both of those items in the solution. One of them, uh, the recommendation actually in the plans and specs, we actually have to restripe the existing parking lot to make them a little bit more standardized. Uh, currently, it's it's funny when you say we have assigned spots because it's more of a assigned area depending on what your parking spot is and what the car next to you parked like. So, um, and I hear people in the audience, so that's funny. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. 
And, and uh, just one other thing, I, I just like the alternatives offered to employees to reduce um, the car trips, and I'm glad to see the use of Metro, although it's a very low percentage, and that's uh, as a director of Metro, along with uh, Supervisor Leopold, uh, we, uh, that it's gone up about 40% in the last three years, I think. So uh, we need uh, better routes or more routes, and we'll work on that at Metro, but uh, that's encouraging, and I, I hope we can, uh, uh, advertise that as much as possible because that's uh, getting cars off the street. You bet. Supervisor Cabot, do you have questions? You, yeah, thank you. Uh, I know uh, with the parking lot next to the building here, um, you know, I, I love green space, but I also realize that we, we do have a real pr uh, parking problem. And uh, I've, I've been advocating for 10 years and more permeable, uh, you know, uh, asphalt and cement and sidewalks that allows the water to go through and and actually go into the ground uh, will the trees <clears throat> that are along the uh, I call it that little bowling uh, lot area they're, they're gonna be spared uh, yes in the plans they, they do they are spared okay and then there's one left one tree left over on the far right and near the parking lot, that one will also make it? Uh, I believe in the plans that one does come out, um, but we can double check the plans, but I do believe that one does come out. Okay. That, that, that's something we could look at, I guess, huh? Because it looks good, healthy, it looks good. <clears throat> With a, per, a permeable asphalt, it would allow the roots to get water and it wouldn't uh, lift up the, uh, the lot. And Emmeline Street, uh, yeah, it definitely uh, uh, needs to be uh, uh, the directory. They got to look. My my eight-year-old twin uh, daughters know the ABCs better than Emmeline Street's uh, uh, way of putting the letters together. You could be standing next to B, and the next closest one is uh, L or something. Uh, <laughs> so that'll be fine. Uh, and for the Watsonville lot, uh, that's, uh, they, we have one that's been put in right now. PG&E just finished their work, the Freedom uh, Campus, and that's also permeable uh, asphalt. Uh, yeah, so the, in the install that they did have permeable, permeable asphalt that we are, I believe, putting in, uh, as well as we're looking at the back side of that uh, campus to uh, restripe the existing asphalt to at least expand our current existing capacity. No, thank you very much. Great. Now is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about this item. Good afternoon, gentlemen and supervisors. My name is Crystal Anderson. I am a deputy district attorney for the county of Santa Cruz. Uh, I wanted to represent the district attorney's association's support, enthusiastic support for item 11. And I also wanted to highlight for the board, if they may be unaware, uh, some unique problems that district attorneys specifically have uh, when getting to this campus and leaving this campus, and that's unique to our our work and I'm going to be speaking in part anecdotally about my own experience but it also represents the experience of the individuals that are remaining here after the carrot cake so <laughs> I do appreciate your time today um, I'm currently assigned to the sexual assault unit but for that I was assigned to general felonies I've been a six-year employee of Santa Cruz County I'm a South County resident I bought my home with my fiance in 2016 and I make the harrowing daily commute on the one uh, to this campus every day. So I am the person that might have angrily responded to the survey. I am the person that comes in uh, every day. But when you sign up to do this type of public service, you know that this is not an eight to five job. There is no way that I could do the work on behalf of the citizens of this community if I just worked from eight to five. In 2018, I had five jury trials. All of them were serious, violent felonies. All of them resulted in guilty verdicts, and all of them were CDC sentences. That was an extraordinary work in 2018 for me, but all of those jury trials took between three and six weeks, and that was not eight to five. I have been in this building uh, after midnight. I have gotten here before 4 a.m. And the colleagues behind me have sacrificed the same amount because that is what justice demands and deserves. 
However, because of the hours that I put in, I have, standing before you, been frightened getting to my car. I have, walking to work with an employee who was also eight and a half months pregnant, been assaulted by somebody who I prosecuted. And I had to take out my personal protection that I carry on me. I had to take out my pepper spray. And I actually stood in front of my colleague that was eight and a half months pregnant to protect her. And that person identified me and knew who I was. And that was my daily walk into work. My colleagues have stepped over human feces and needles and other people that they've unfortunately prosecuted in the community that have been standing by their cars late at night. This is a, a, a real risk to us. It was a real risk in that moment. I'm glad I picked the right thing there and actually stood with my eight and a half month pregnant colleague that I stayed with her and we remained friends. I didn't just run away. Uh, and that's a choice that I made then, but I really encourage the board to adopt uh, item 11 today. I love this work. I love serving this community. I love living in this community. And this is a really important, impact part of my work is trying to get here safe and trying to leave safe. One of the things uh, they noted was this 3 p.m. shuffle that a majority of workers go get their cars and return back at 3 p.m. into the lot when it's less busy. That is impossible for a trial attorney to request the courts to take a break so that we can go retrieve our vehicles. And there are no trial attorneys that are taking that 3 p.m. break. Instead, they're doing the work that needs to be done. They're prepping witnesses for the next day. Yes. I appreciate the court, the, the court. You're not a court. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you he very much. You went to much. law school, though. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. They pay me for a reason. <laughs> <clears throat> Would anyone else like to speak to us? Please come forward. Hello, Bird. Um, I just want to thank you for all your dedication to our community. I don't think that you get thanked enough. I think people always try to point the fingers at you. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate all of you. I'd like to say some important park, how important parking is, not only for the public, but for the jurors, for county vehicles, and for employees. Um, I often see people stressed out finding, trying to find parking. I think it's time to expand in an environmentally friendly fashion. And I think what is presented to you today is just that. I hope that we can move forward with this and help people park in our community. And again, thank you all. Thank you, and thank you for helping uh, General Services Most think definitely. through all the issues. Most definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I've discussed this issue with you many times, so I appreciate staff bringing it um, forward for some improvements. I'm encouraged. And I'm distressed to hear the, the tales of the, um, the district attorney's office, and I want to know what we can do to um, make a better plan to make them safer. That's very distressing. Um, I did send you a message, and I did see it was included in public comment on this, but um, I would like to see no trees cut down. <laughs> there were already six redwood trees cut down there uh, a few years ago. There were many, many trees cut down from around this building, and I don't see any landscaping or trees planted in this new site. I applaud that it would be permeable, but what I would like to see is um, future plans. I know it's expensive, but to go up, and that's the mantra, right? <laughs> we go up when space is uh, restricted. So what about um, in, in, say, the judge's area or someplace, uh, a, a multi-level um, parking structure that would be secured with, with gate passes that could have some sort of a, a secure access for these people 
who are doing good community service work and, and working at odd hours so that they would not have to be threatened and pull out their pepper spray just to do their job. I do note Gary Patton's um, comment to you too, so I want to uh, give a nod to him. I, um, in my comment, I suggest that there be uh, an elimination of assigned parking altogether that would free up all those 40 per day average that go unused. Um, as a family member of a person who used to work and ride a, a recumbent bicycle, there is no secure place for bicyclists. Not here at Ocean Street and not at Emmeline, especially for people who ride recumbent bicycles. Um, and finally, I just want to say uh, thank you for restriping the, the parking lot for more efficient parking and less guesswork. Um, I would like to encourage free bus passes for employees. I would like to encourage more charging stations around and to suggest there be no ticket Tuesdays for uh, to encourage the members of the public to come and not be limited in how long they can stay. I want to applaud the wayfinding um, signs in the elevators, I think those are great. And I um, am happy to see a, a sandwich board out at the top that I have seen before but has not been up before or recently, directing members of the public to the Board of Supervisors chambers. Having something like that at the ground floor for people who have never been here before and are very intimidated anyway, um, that would be helpful and welcoming as well as having some wayfinding signs in the stairwells. Um, I, I do know, because I get here at 8 a.m. <laughs> to go to the law library these days, I do see that there are county employees with passes. They have yellow placards, and they're parking in the two-hour visitor sites, too. So if there is a real shortage. I see that, and I'm happy to see that the county is, is going to do some work to make it better. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for bringing this item forward. I, I would like to just uh, briefly comment on the on this uh, 40 spot issue that keeps coming up. I, I don't think that all those spots are created the same. I think that there needs to be a, a better understanding of the employees that are in and out of this sort of average opening, because some actually come on and off campus frequently as part of their position, and some are more stationary. And I think that what you wouldn't want to do would be eliminate the opportunity for someone who, by the way, nature of their job, has to come on and off campus, and it appears as though it's leaving an empty spot when it really is actually not. And so I think we have to do a better analysis of what that is. But with that said, um, I, I would like to move the recommended actions. So we got a motion by Friend, a second by McPherson. Supervisor Leopold. Um, uh, I'm generally supportive of what we're trying to do here. I think the conversion of, of uh, space managed by parks to parking, uh, we should uh, consult with the Parks Commission. And since they have a meeting on June 3rd, I, I'd like the direction that we accept this report, um, come back with the wayfinding in January, and then just go to the Parks Commission and come back to our board on June 11th uh, with their recommendations, if there are, if there are any. Um, because I think that's a good public process, uh, and I was uh, I was hopeful to, to include that as part of uh, um, the direction. I mean, it's fine with me. I think that what we could would you be amenable to this item? Then I think that the board is is fine in concept with this item. It sounds like, and so maybe just bringing it back on consent agenda, absent some sort of significant change. Yeah, I mean, I think we should we should we should get the feedback from them if they if they agree wholeheartedly, put it on consent, and if they have um, uh, meaningful input that we that we need to consider, we need to put that on the regular agenda. I mean, I, I leave it to the chair as to where the best <laughs> location for it is. Yeah, the, so June 11th is going to be a very busy agenda, so um, so it would be a likely consent agenda because I don't think we'll have time for a substantive discussion. So as long as that's the that's likely where we're headed, just so people know. I would add the additional direction is, you know, I do see people doing their burpees out on the asphalt uh, there. It doesn't look super comfortable. So to the extent that we can identify uh, other sites in and around the place where people can exercise and do do their workouts I think that would be that would, the Parks Commission could give us some good information about that 
All right, so I'll move the recommended actions with the additional direction that this go to the Parks Commission for some input and come back to the board on June 11th on the consent agenda. Okay, so we got a motion and I, a, I think Ms. Can I, get, can I just get clarification? Can we move forward with the request to advertise or do you want us to wait on that until we get the June 11th, come back on June 11th? Well, I, I would think that in order to respect whatever the Parks Commission has to say, we should wait to, to okay. advertise. I just want to get clarification. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, just clarify that. Sure. Uh, are we going to move forward or not? We're, we're going to send it to the Parks Commission to get their feedback and it's going to come back June 11th. The chair anticipates that it'll be on consent agenda. Um, and it'll, it'll unless they consent. give us something that we need to, to talk about, right? Okay. And it, the rest, it, the it other. It would be the second vote on June 11th. It'll be the first, well, it'll be the first action vote. We're really just accepting the report today, uh, allowing for additional input through the Parks Commission and bringing it back to us on June 11th. I, I'll say, though, that. I, I would be surprised that the Parks Commission is going to say anything that's going to sway my uh, support of this. So I think that you have a board majority that's already interested in this. I respect, though, that there is interest in ensuring that since it's a J it is technically something that's controlled by parks, that we I think that that makes sense from a process perspective. But I, I, I don't want to take away from the fact that I felt like you did a significant amount of outreach to a lot of groups within uh, the county already. So I, I think that we should respect that component as well. But I'm willing to uh, just have this come back on consent on the 11th. And that's what the motion is. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Uh, now we are on to uh, item 12, which is considered final appointment of Bertha uh, Villalobos to the Community Health Center's co-applicant commission as an at-large patient representative for a term to expire on December 11, 2022. Move approval. Uh, well, is there any public comment? Seeing none, we got Move a motion by Leopold. Second. Second by friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll now be moving into closed session. Uh, will there be any reportable action from closed session? Depending on your vote, yes. Okay, thank you.